Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. No choice with gun mandate. Get it on. Thanks for listening and thanks for tuning in. We love that about you. Normally, we'd say hi to Gina Grad about now. I'll tell you a little more about that story. But, uh, and bald Brian, I don't like black people. Easy, buddy. Now these mics are on. Whoa, whoa. These things are hot. Uh, Gina's father passed away. Um, a short period of time ago. So Gina is going to be taking a few days off. She was uh, very much in love with her father. Her father uh, struggled for quite some time with an illness. And, uh, you know, that's why Gina has been sort of not here because um, she's been wanting to visit her father who was in a facility and uh, he finally passed. So we know it's a very hard time for Gina and uh, her family. And if you could send her tweets that uh, support her and uplift her, that would be uh, much appreciated. She's a very good person. She's a very sensitive soul. And she's very much in love with her father. And so this is a big hit to the grad family. So um, our thoughts, prayers, condolences are with Gina and her family. And uh, Gina will come back shortly and uh if when she's you know willing to talk about it then we'll we'll get into uh, some of that with her it says a lot about the listenership of the show i think that a lot of people have already reached out you know sending her nice thoughts and generally you know th- th- i saw a lot of tweets that she retweeted or that she responded to said I, I i listened to your dad i'd know him personally you know i was a big fan and he obviously raised a uh you know, a great, a great kid. So it's a, it's a nice, um, nice reflection of our listenership. I think. Agreed. So let's uh, keep those um, nice sentiments and thoughts going toward uh, Gina. I, I know it means a, a quite a deal. It's quite a big deal to her, and, and and especially during this time. So it really would mean a lot if you guys would reach out and uh, have some kind words for uh, her and her family. Thank you. All right, let's see. So we got uh, just Bald and I today. Uh, Dawson's mm-hmm. taking over the news, everybody. Oh, boy. Well, you know, he's uh, segueing into his stand-up career. So he's going to need a little extra mic time. Got to get those reps in. Going to be uh, up on stage at Jam in the Van Speakeasy. it will be March 25th out here in Los Angeles. And uh, Loxie's playing as well. Loxie, you got a, you got a set list? Do we know what we're going with? Definitely something finger popping. Uh, yeah. we're, we're still figuring it out, um, and I'll make sure you. Not some solo it acoustic originals. <laughs> no, no, none of those. those. Those don't really move the needle. Well, but here. people are going to need to use the bathroom at some point, so maybe oh, we'll oh. Mix, mix one of those in. Okay, yeah. Here's okay, the I'll... signal to the audience: just say, "Here's one off our new album." That's right. <laughs> and that'll be a signal. <laughs> okay, I'll toss one in. So <laughs> simulate a fire drill. <laughs> we got that. Uh, we got that uh, coming up. We have the uh, we have uh, liked tweets, which used to be favorite tweets, but I don't know. We can't call them favorite tweets anymore. They're just like these. You guys tweet me stuff. Uh, I like them and um, got a couple of decent ones. I can't remember if we got before on rich man, poor man. Um, I think we got one that says uh, car cannot pass emissions. Which yeah. is classic not, or just junker? Yeah, the classic Duesenberg is not going to pass it, and uh, the uh, AMC Matador that uh, stepdad drives is not going to pass it either. And the other one that I liked, I like the deeper cuts, which is, uh, and I think we did this one before, but I like it anyway, which is um, acutely aware of the price of aluminum. So either you're recycling cans and you're at the very bottom of the food chain or you're trading in commodities and uh, you need to know what those aluminum, what aluminum goes for a pound. Either way, the middle class need not apply. Never knows. All right. So we got the intro to like tweets here, Dawson. Here's the tweets he liked. He didn't reply because he cannot type. Here's the tweets he liked. Send him by you to piss him off all day and all night. Here's the tweets he liked. All right. In no particular order, what do we got? All right. Well, first off, uh, that rich man, poor man, that knows the price of aluminum was sent to you by at Angel Puncher. So thanks for sending that in. Uh, let's let's start it off with people are tweeting you this this L.A. Times article 
about hiking. The title of the article is Hiking Has a Diversity Problem. <laughs> These BIPOC groups are working to fix it. BIPOC is black, indigenous, people of color. Uh-huh. So, uh, They're not the Korean boy band? No. <laughs> no. Ironically, they are BIPOC. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is so the article starts mm. off with uh, long time oppression and historical barriers have kept many people of color from feeling comfortable in the American outdoors. Now mm. that mm. may be changing. Groups in Southern oh, California, around the nation, have made it their goal to introduce. People. Now this is the great outdoors. This isn't just about going outdoors, this right? Is the great outdoors. <laughs> leaving your home because uh, people of color they they feel comfortable leaving their house, right? Yeah, I think they can get into the open. I air. saw that Friday's movie. <laughs> yeah, Seems that's... like they're out of the house. Yeah. That's... Okay. Uh, they are groups mm-hmm. in Southern California and around the nation have made it their goal to introduce people of color to nature in a positive way, and then they introduce groups who are working toward a more diverse outdoors. Well, well I would, you know, look, I would argue that uh, this is good for everybody: hit the trail, get outdoors, convene with nature, all that good stuff. And it, it's true that it's more of a geographical thing like i grew up right in the middle of north hollywood california it was just asphalt everywhere and 7-elevens and coin-op laundries there was not a lot of convening with nature my parents didn't have the will or the transportation to really get us up the mountain but it wasn't so much uh, this was a bunch of white boys it was just we didn't have the vehicle that would get us there we didn't have the range to get anywhere so we just sort of stuck in like a four mile right we would get out to the sepulveda basin every once in a while oh god we had neither will nor wheels <laughs> we would ride our bikes uh six miles to go to the sepulveda flood basin and uh you know trench around explain in the, in the to marsh. people outside the area what that is how just how sad that is the Sepulveda Basin, uh, they have a little... It's like a concrete sink. Yeah, there's a there's one side of it is sort of a dam. And the one side of it that has the dam has a weird futuristic kind of look from the 70s. And they would film movies there. Like, like I don't know, Escape from L.A. and um, Big Trouble in Little China and stuff. And like car commercials and stuff would be like sort of on one side of the dam. That was just the opening that led the flood control into the L.A. River. But the L.A. River, as we've said, is not a river. It's just a cement flume that takes shit to the uh, Santa Monica Bay. The other side of it was kind of swamp. Just uh, dragonflies and uh, plants and reeds and things like that. And back in the day, a long time ago, you could just go putts around in the swamp it's just polluted water and you just roll up your jeans and you know get a little fan boat with a little cox motor on it or something and just sort of buzz around but ride our bikes through it but we used to do that there but you know it's it, the 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 premise is always that we're preventing certain groups from doing certain things I don't know that anyone's preventing them from doing anything. It's just when you live in the middle of South Central, it's kind of hard to get up to Bear Mountain unless uh, moms and pops have a car that'll get you up to Bear Mountain. But continue, Max Zapata. But anyway, I do, uh, as I've said, we're now at the point where there's so little racism, we have to find it on the hiking trails. But uh, go ahead. So they give about seven or eight groups that you can join in their hiking groups to help solve this problem. One of them is Latino Outdoors. Mm -hmm. They have a national organ. They're a national organization with a Los Angeles chapter, and they call the process of removing barriers, quote, the hike before the hike. Ah, uh, we got to remove the barriers. Are these yeah. tank traps? <laughs> are these uh, Burmese tiger traps? What kind of barriers are we talking about? These are the invisible ones. The that invisible we barriers. Oh, please, dear God, if anyone ever tries to hold me down, do it with an invisible, invisible barrier. barrier. <laughs> I prefer those two. Yes. Uh, the idea... I don't want the railroad tie over my neck. I want the invisible type of barrier that says I can't do something. Much more preferable. Yeah, and uh, while we're at it, if you're going to put a ceiling, make it a glass one. I want to look up the skirt of the chick who's working above me. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of Latina outdoors is mm-hmm. that people of color see themselves represented on the trail. 
Uh, the, that's a, another, I feel, misnomer, this thing of like, I need to see people that look like me hiking, otherwise I shan't hike. I uh, I feel like, look, there's a, I, at least out here in SoCal, I, I see all kinds uh, hiking out there and have zero thoughts about them looking different than me, but okay. Well, then you're probably not going to be joining Hike Club anytime soon either. Evelyn Escobar grew up hiking with her tia, Spanish for aunt. As she went on excursions in national parks, she felt out of place as a black Latina and noticed that people looked at her funny. Well, again, the look at you funny part, I don't think there's such a thing as me going on a hike on that horse trail behind my house without saying I passed somebody who looked at me funny. But I do not know how to define that. I'm not sure what they were looking at. Maybe it's because I wasn't wearing a mask. Smoking. Smoking. (laughs) Wheezing. The dog was smoking. Never know. (laughs) Yes. Anyway, she's out of place. So she's out of place. So she created a hiking community with an Instagram account and some friends a few years ago. They have over 20,000 followers. And uh, they're killing it. So, and the the other ones are disabled hikers. The one that bothers me the most is outdoor Asian. Oh That's yeah, a group. Oh, you guys are boy. not welcome on the trail. Well, all these people are talking about it. They have twenty thousand people, or th- tens of thousands of people, thirty three thousands of people at Black Girls Trekking. Outdoor Asians has 160 black members. Black women be trekking. Oh, man. You can't stop a black woman from trekking. Yeah, the black girls trekking. They have tens huge. of thousands, and the, your Asians have what? We have a, our Facebook group has 160 members. Oh, oh, man. Yeah, so we got to everybody get, get on Outdoor Asian. Easy for you to take over, Chris. Yeah, I know, I yeah know. a lot of upside <laughs> for Asian trekkers. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so that article tweeted you a few times, Adam, and that's in the LA Times. Now let's let's move forward with. Hold on, let me just say this, Adam. As it pertains to the funny looks and the I guess perceived racism on the trail, I haven't done a ton of hiking, but the little I have, my perception of hikers are amongst the most liberal members of our society. Like these are people who want to convene with nature. We're probably very accepting. I I I can't don't want to generalize, even though I am, but I think of them tend towards the liberal side. Well, Brian, you bring up a very valid point, which is. And especially if you're talking L.A. Times, because people are out hiking around the Santa Monica Mountains and doing all these trails up above, you know, the ho- up mm-hmm. in Hollywood and all these. Yes, these aren't a bunch of guys who look like Rush Limbaugh wearing MAGA hats and carrying M16s. They, these this would be I would I would say that if you stopped your average hiker on your average trail in SoCal and said, where do you lean politically? I would say 84% of them would lean left, probably be. Who did you vote for? Yeah. yeah, They'd say Gavin Newsom. Yeah. Yeah. So it's true. It's kind of funny when they do all the discussion about racism and systemic racism and racism, and they put it into a place like, you know, the school, you know, the school systems, the system schools who are amongst the most liberal people on the planet, the teachers, the teachers, unions, representatives, the faculty, Mm -hmm. the administrators. I mean, especially in Los Angeles, the elite of the elite, the tip of the liberal spear is going to be teachers, schools and hikers, probably the same People hiking are probably teachers who refuse to go back to fucking work and do their job at this point. But if those people are looking at you askance, uh, then I would say we have uh, we've got our work cut out for us because and also when you pass people on the trail, it is a kind of a weird dance. Like sometimes it's narrow and somebody has to stand off to the side. Sometimes people have a dog and people look at the dog. Sometimes people are wearing something funky or different or weird fanny packs or something like people all kind of check out the people that are going past them. I don't think as a heterosexual white male, I don't look at it as anything other than I'm passing someone in the trail. But if you want to read racism into everything, then then be my guest, Los Angeles Times. Okay. All right. Well, another thing that's been tweeted uh, to you is there's a lot of hubbub going on with tin horn flats. Now, we talked to your old high school classmate, Barrett Lapigian, a, a couple months ago when they were still open during uh, California being in the purple tier, or at least L.A. County being in the purple tier. 
and you actually went over there to eat. Well, now that restaurants are starting to open back up, Tin Horn Flats has been ordered, one, to have their electricity disconnected, which has happened. So in right. response, they put up a bunch of generators at the restaurant to still serve. Wow, it's an arms race. And, yeah. uh, and when they had the electricity disconnected, the judge said, look, we are not, we're going to forego the other order of padlocking the doors, but we'll just cut their electricity. Well, after the generator thing, the judge has now ordered to padlock the doors. And in response, Tin Horn Flats has removed their doors from, from the wow, building. Wow, they're so saloon you, doors. So you can't padlock doors that aren't there. Yeah. All right. That's a, that's a T-shirt. Keep working, Burbank City Council and judges to smash fucking taxpayers. And also, I mean, as previously discussed, I talked to Drew about this. There is no outdoor transmission. There's no outdoor transmission. So you guys deciding to cancel outdoor dining is completely arbitrary. It's based in no science. When Mark Garagos confronted you guys, uh, you just went and hired a third law firm. You did not offer any proof as to why. And even the judge sided with Garagos saying, uh, look, guys, now you have to come up with some data that says it's dangerous to eat outdoors. You can't just randomly shut down businesses. And by the way, You'd already shut down the business, so the businesses moved outdoors. They got their plexiglass. They got their heat lanterns. They got their canopies. They did. They complied with all so, yeah, your cocktail rules. It went above and beyond, and then you shut that down, which is the only way these places can, who are already hanging on by thread can stay in existence, not to mention their employees, all the people that work for them and all the folks that bring the food and all the various different subcontractors that a restaurant needs in order to stay in business. But you shut all that down. These guys defied you, probably mostly out of desperation, but maybe they were just doing it because they thought it was their patriotic duty. And now it's time to punish them. And the real reason you have to punish Tin Horn Flats is not to punish Tin Horn Flats. It's to send a message to any oh, it's, it's, any other business. It feels purely symbolic at this point, kind of on both sides, but it, it doesn't feel like it's anything's being born out of practicality or reason. Right. It is. But then L.A. County, why is outdoor dining available now? Why did you lift it after four weeks? Why is indoor dining to, I don't know, 25% or 10% or whatever the stupid, stupid science says the capacity is. So here's the deal, <clears throat> Burbank City Council. Eat a cock. <laughs> you fuckers need to eat a fucking dick. You made a mistake. You fucked up. Now give them a fucking fruit basket and apologize to them. Or just keep squandering taxpayer money and going along the direction you're going. If you're looking for the best dick in town, come to Tin Horn Flats. No doors. <laughs> That's right. Lots of dick. <laughs> Lots of dick. Go down to Tin Horn Flats, Burbank City Council, and judge and eat a fucking dick, you fucking. You, this is turning into some kind of republic. You know, everyone's like, oh, well, what do you, you know, what what's with the hyperbole? I don't know. Not a lot of hyperbole here. This is what we're doing. You guys shut down a business for no reason scientifically whatsoever. They dared to defy you, and now they must be punished. But who's really getting punished? The guys who own Tin Horn Flats, all their employees, all the people that, all the distributors that work with them and provide their food and their drinks and everything else. Like, who are you really punishing, Burbank, other than another fucking taxpayer? Garagos must know this. And have you guys talked about, is this, is, is Burbank... City Council somehow more onerous than the LA because if Burbank is its own city for people outside the area, Burbank's one of the few like its own cities that can enforce its own rules. But mm -hmm. it's obviously beholden a county. Are they more onerous in the county, or, the, or why is this? Where's the rub? Is what I'm getting at. Do you even know? They're probably more onerous. We will uh, catch people up on this when I talk to Mark. Um, they're smaller and can probably focus more of their vitriol on crushing a private private business than LA County, which is just bigger and more spread out, probably has more sure. bureaucracy. But uh, either way, go down to Tin Horn Flats, everybody, and get yourself a victory burger. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ, Burbank. I always knew Burbank was a piece of shit, but uh, now they're showing it. And 
I don't know what the grand plan is, Burbank. Is this something you think is going to win over society or more constituents? You think more people agree with you than of a struggling small business that's been family run for 40 years in the same fucking location, paying all the taxes and all the pulling all the permits and doing all the stuff that goes along with that? All right, ass wipes. Jesus Christ. Ugh. Just the fact that they just the fact that they do this shit with impunity is the scary part. Think about the fucking optics of this, you assholes. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. Moving on. At Mr. Man 77 had a tweet for you. And we're going to we're going to get into the details of Marvin Hagler's death and news. But he he tweeted you saying, I was just gutted hearing about Marvin Hagler. His fights with Sugar, Roberto, Tommy Hearns are probably the best memories I have of the 80s. Please share your thoughts on the podcast of any memories that you have. Uh, Hagler's a, an interesting guy. I mean, he had his name legally changed to Marvelous. That's good. So his first name. Is he the dude that moved to Italy and like yes. lived there for like decades? And yes. He interesting dude. Ch- changed his name to Marvelous. God, it was something like 56, 3 and 3 or something. He had a, he had a really spectacular record. Um, he was considered unbeatable during his reign as a middleweight. Uh, of course, the Sugar Ray Leonard fight, it's a very interesting story. Sugar Ray had had his retina detached, was sort of medically retired from boxing. I think Sugar Ray sat oh, 62, 3 and 2. That's a, wow. that's a pretty substantial record. Um, Sugar Ray just sat and watched Marvin dismantle guys during his, I think, three-year three hiatus where he didn't box. And uh, he said, I want to come back. And they said, like, well, who do you want to come back with? Like some sort of tune-up fight or tomato can or something. And he's like, I want to come back against Marvin Hagler. And everyone was like, you can't come back against Marvin Hagler. He has not. He's been destroying everyone, and it's been uninterrupted. You've been sitting around for three years. But Sugar Ray studied the films and had a plan. Now, if you watch that fight, and I did in its entirety when I was in Vegas several months back, um, Sugar Ray didn't win the fight. It was kind of a draw. He never really hurt Hagler. He threw a lot of punches and bunches. His whole thing was somebody slap on the ring apron when there's 30 seconds left in every round, and I'll just go to town at the end of every round and win the end of every round, and we've talked about it before. Um, he never hurt Hagler, and Hagler, that didn't really hurt him. Sugar Ray was moving a lot, very inspired. Sugar Ray fought the fight of his life. He did not beat the champ, but... It was so huge that he was off for three years, had the detached Mm -hmm. retina, came back, fought an unbeatable guy, and went all 12 rounds, I believe it was back then, uh, that they gave him the win. And Hagler... He defied expectations. Yes, he exceeded expectations. he, He exceeded expectations, and I think they graded him a little on a curve, and they gave him the win, and Hagler was disgusted by it. And Hagler said, fuck this, I'm retiring, I'm moving to Italy, I'm doing movies. And he left on the table some massive paydays. He could have had, you know, a second fight possibly with Sugar Ray. He he had another fight with, could have had Hearns, Duran, or whoever else was uh, in the division back then. Big time payday. I... He retired at probably 34, maybe 36. He was was young, young youngish. He, he could have had three or four mega payday fights before he retired, but he said, fuck it. And Lord knows, I'm sure they tried to get him out of retirement quite a few times. There had to be quite a few promoters saying to Hagler, come back to the States. One more fight with Sugar Ray. We'll There's get a lot you. of money in it for you. Oh, I mean, he could have made 15, 20 million bucks, and that would have been circa 1993 or 92 or something yeah. like that. Uh, but he never did. He never came back. And uh, stayed in retirement in, until he died. So uh, for that alone, we should appreciate the man. Um, and was a great, great fighter. And Brian, one of the first bald guys. I know. To, <clears throat> back when bald really meant something. Meant something. I know. But now you can go bald. You just be a part of the trend. I right. see you bald people. It's not right. going to work. 
Right, but uh, Hagler was an early adapter of the bald bald dome, and uh, and really, I would say, sort of like Tyson in that he was one of the most feared guys in the division for an extended period of time, like probably almost a decade of being being that guy. Also, I think had a half-brother named Sims or something who was pretty good, but I don't think he would fight him because he's uh, his half-brother. Although the average person fights with their brother physically <laughs> way more than point. they fight with strangers. So Might I, as well get paid for it. <laughs> right. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that's an excuse. And as far as the mom goes, it's win win because either way, her son's walking out of there holding a strap above his head, no matter which one fights. Which was was it Sims? Robbie which, Sims. Robbie Sims was his half brother. Yeah. He was a good fighter too, and they would never Fight, but they were. Um, I don't know what did Robbie. I think say? it might actually. Might, I'm looking at it. It might be full brother and also a southpaw. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, Robbie Sims is. But then, how did Hagler and Sims come about? Like, I got a sister, but her last name is Corolla. It's not Sims. Yeah, All the, yeah I know. You, <laughs> she has well, a featherweight. I, I think fight. they would note I would that half brother, but <laughs> everywhere's just saying brother. But maybe they're just being generous. I think they're rounding up because. Yeah. Uh, Oftentimes, when he's a full brother, you share the last name. But typically, that, typically, that's, Brian, that's, do you find that to, almost to always? Does I your mean, brother really use your rare, last name? He does, and rarely with exception. Yeah, I would say. And then, furthermore, if your brother was marvelous Marvin Hagler and one of the best pound for pound fighters of all time, and you were getting into the boxing game, I feel like you would keep the Hagler. The Hagler name, even even more reasons to do it. So uh, probably half brother with yeah, Sims. I'll take it. What was Sims's record? What did he end up doing? Sims, and uh, Sims is a thirty-eight, ten and two. Yeah, he was a pretty good guy. He was in the same division. All right, what else we got, Max? All right, let's see one more. At Zaza asks Adam, "Did you ever watch Mash when you were younger? I'd love to hear your thoughts on the show." God. Mash was appointment viewing. It was a TV show in Adam's youth, so yes, he absolutely watched Yes, it. was it on? Yes. If it was on TV and I was alive, uh, that's all I had. Uh, Mash was a show we enjoyed, uh, All in the Family, you know, it was of that ilk. Um, it started to kind of jump the shark when uh, Alan, Ald- Alan Alda got kind of woke. He kind of went from actor to spokes activist, activist mm-hmm. you know, kind of thing. And he had some stuff to say and he started working the message in a little more than the comedy. And uh, I actually, Chris pulled a clip of my uh, audio book of In 50 Years We'll All Be Chicks. And I think uh, MASH was discussed. Let's talk MASH for a second. One of my favorite TV shows of all time. I was watching a rerun of MASH the other day. By the way, I've seen the show 2,000 times, but never noticed one important thing. Alan Alda's huge dry mop of 70s hair. Mm. And B.J. Honeycutt's massive pube fro and walrus mustache. And then it dawned on me, this show's supposed to be about the Korean War. The Korean War, or conflict, as you angry veterans would tell me, took place from 1950 to 1953. Not only did no one in the military have that hair, no one in society had that hair. Trapper John was rocking a full-blown Jufro in what was supposed to be 1950. Back then, no guy left the house without a handful of pomade. And the only guys with mustaches in the 50s were either carnival barkers or Latin band leaders. And theirs were dripping with wax. At least on happy days, they tempted to look like their hair was living in the same decade until somewhere around season three when Ralph Mouth said, fuck it, I'm getting a blow dryer. And that's when everyone's hair jumped the shark. I blame Elvis for this phenomenon. He made 425 movies in nine months, which meant whether he played an Old West gunslinger or an Egyptian pharaoh, his hair always looked like Dick Clark circa 1955. By the way, MASH aired from 1972 to 1983, so the show lasted nearly four times as long as the event it was portraying. The only other time in television history that happened was Roots. 
Well, there you go. It turns out I had strong thoughts about MASH uh, about 11 years ago when I wrote that book. All right, we got uh, Who the F Sells This S coming up. And uh, first I'll tell you about uh, Relief Ban. Oh, there's nothing worse than a nausea, like poor Gina in the back of the car with Mike August driving on a road trip. Uh, the, the feeling of nausea, the oh. absolute worst. Yes. You know who this is good for? This is timely. For people who are listening or are going to get their uh, second shot at some point, you know, a month or two months down the road, I've heard a lot of people get nausea, get a, get a hold of one of these, and maybe it'll uh, cut it off of the pass. Good call. Relief Band. It's the number one FDA cleared anti nausea wristband, clinically proven to relieve nausea and vomiting from motion sickness, morning sickness, chemotherapy, anxiety, hangovers, possible COVID vaccinations, migraines, and more. 100% drug free, non drowsy, fast acting, all natural relief with zero side effects. Originally developed 20 years ago in hospitals. Now it's over the counter. Relief band stimulates a nerve in your wrist. It goes to the part of your brain that controls nausea and blocks the signal to your stomach that tells you you're sick. This thing works. It sounds like magic, but it is clinically proven. It is Relief Band, right, Dawson? As the world's opening back up, don't let the fear of nausea keep you on the sidelines. Right now, Relief Band has an exclusive offer just for Adam Carolla listeners. If you go to ReliefBand.com and use promo code Adam, you'll receive 20% off, plus free shipping, and a no-questions-asked 30-day money-back guarantee. So head to R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use our promo code Adam for 20% off, plus free shipping. All right, we'll take a quick break. Come back with who the F sells this S right after this. And now, a tip from the 1965 issue of Good Housekeeping. 120 ways to please a man. It's easy to stay slim when there's a reason. He likes you that way. Control figure faults with daily exercise and correct posture and watch those calories. Just one of 120 ways to please a man. Now back to the Adam Carolla Show. Posture used to be a big deal. All those sitcoms like, dear, stand up. You'll stand up and pull your shoulders back. back. No man will want you if you're slumped over. Put this book on your head. Walk across the room. That was always the big deal when someone's entering a beauty pageant back then. All right. We got uh, Tony with an I. That means it's a woman, right? Most likely. Pasadena. Oh, you stop by our house on the way home. I shall. Uh, when you're not trolling oh, for prostitutes sorry. on Craigslist, you'll notice <laughs> some crazy stuff for sale. Knife block, perfect condition, but no knives. One dollar, cash only. So it's time to answer the question: Who the fuck sells this shit? All right, there we go. Now there's uh, Tony. <clears throat> Tony. Yes. You are uh, selling vintage clothespins. Yes, I am. And what is vintage about? This old wooden kind? No, they're actually from the 80s. Um, and they're like these round circular discs. Um, mm-hmm. oh. And they're like an alternative to the old-fashioned uh, clothespins. Mm. I'm not sure. So, about, yeah, scary that the 80s are now vintage, but I guess I they... know, isn't it? It's horrible. <laughs> they're like chip clips the size of a quarter that you pinch on top of the clothes, obviously. Yeah, and then you would just like use that instead of your the old-fashioned wooden kind. And they're a little bit more colorful and decorative. And who is hanging clothes on a clothesline <laughs> these days? <clears throat> um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh <laughs> <clears throat> I'm scared personally to do it because I've seen way too many movies where as soon as I'm done hanging the clothes, a bunch of convicts jump over the fence, pull them off and change into them out of their prison jumpsuits so they can reintegrate into society. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a possibility, I guess. It's a real possibility. (laughs) Judging by movies, it's a hundred percent possibility. So $5, what did you pay for them? I actually got them, I think, at an escape cell because I, I, they, I, they, they were just cool. I'm like, this is cool, something cool to get. Um, yeah, yeah. And then really? they were like a couple dollars. I think it was like $2 or something. So I want to make a, a profit on these things. <clears throat> yeah. You know? Is this so. how you make your bones? You walk around at estate <laughs> sales, you buy things for $2 and then sell them and spend two weeks selling them for $5? <laughs> 
it's called flipping. Uh, yeah, I try to. A couple bucks here, a couple bucks there. You know, it'll add up. <laughs> Yeah, but, it'll it'll add up to a couple bucks, but not, yeah. not that much. What's going on? What's going on with you, Tony? That this is uh, where you ended up. Um. Well, you know, doing like I, I've always been a yard sale person. You know, it's more of a hobby than like a money thing. But it's mm-hmm. just, uh, you know, it, it's just something fun. I like the vintage stuff. Um, and it, the, the thing that's crazy, like I. You know, I'll go to yard sale. I don't really ever buy on Craigslist, um, mm-hmm. but people buy on Craigslist and they'll buy the craziest thing. Sometimes, um, I mean, I sold anything from like a measuring cup, an actual just one measuring cup. Someone c- came and bought that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've sold, uh, my biggest craziest sell probably was, a. Uh, I used to be a runner in high school. And so when you go to 5Ks and stuff, you get trophies and ribbons. They give, they give trophies to anybody. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, had a collection of these trophies that I carried around from, you know, house to house to house in a big box the size of a trunk. Um, and one day I looked at them and I'm like, what am I doing with these trophies? Like, I, it's just, I, I wanted to get rid of them. So I'm like, I didn't want to throw them away because it's, you know, I worked hard on that. Um, but I didn't, I wanted to donate them, but nobody wanted to take them. <laughs> So I put him on. I put him on Craigslist for five bucks, and somebody actually, believe it or not, came and bought about you know hundred different plaques, trophies, and medals for me um, for what five bucks. For, <laughs> what is for the raw material? No, they I, actually said I that they were going to do it for a nonprofit they were having. They were going to do some mm. sort of like skating, like uh, derby thing, and they were just going to give out. Some trophy. So what, was your name was, was your name on any of these? No, things? no, no. Of course, I took anything that had my name off. I pulled it off, but um, so I kind of felt I felt better than throwing them in the trash. You know, it was just kind of like yeah, at least give nice. them something to. Yeah, I feel like I'm not throwing all my hard work in the trash. So <laughs> uh, retired on disability, probably. What's going on? Divorced? What's happening? So I am. I'm 54. Mm-hmm. I actually am going through a divorce right now, mm. and I'm actually home with mom and dad. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. They must be delighted. <laughs> they are delighted. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, this is where I've been. So this past year has been pretty rough. You know, my parents are older. Um, so I've been kind of here just with them. You think not you're, doing much. Don't you think your ex may have wanted some of those trophies and ribbons as a sort of a keepsake? Yeah, I don't think he cared. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, was the cause of the divorce. <laughs> and uh, why didn't you keep the house? I mean, why you have to move in with your parents? Oh uh, well, we 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 kind of just we sold the house, and um, I had uh, I actually moved out into another place and then, Oh my God, my life is so sad. <laughs> then I lost my job. And so oh at that point I figured the best place to do is move in with my parents so that I could find a place that I was comfortable with. Um, didn't have to rush to get something. And then COVID hit and, um, my parents are 81 and 86. So, um, mm-hmm. I decided to stay here with them you know, I, just to get I, them uh, through that. Through what's the, that like? I, I've visited my parents for about 50 minutes at a time, and it's about 47 minutes too much each time. I, <laughs> I couldn't imagine living under the same roof in a, what I'm guessing is a modest house, right? Yeah, I know. Actually, the, our house is a pretty decent-sized house. It's a, a lot of room, so I have my space. But, um, yeah, it's been... I. I feel like I'm a kid. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm 17 years old again. It's ridiculous. I just, I don't suggest it to anybody no, <laughs> to do this. No. Not a good thing. No, it it's like <clears throat> same house. I grew up when I was, you know, I'm six, 16, 17. I was living in the same room that I am right now. So oh, it's, you're back in that. Wow. It's a wow. Will yep. Ferrell movie. Yeah. yeah. We got to get you. What's, what's your profession beside this super lucrative fast paced world of flipping <laughs> shit you get at uh, yard sales for $2 profit? What, what else do you do? So I was another thing. I, the more I talk, the more you're going to be like, Oh, this poor woman. Um, yeah, I was, I was in the restaurant business. Um, I was, uh, I actually did like the accounting and stuff for different restaurants and that all went down the tubes this past year. So 
I've been on unemployment. Um, we are going to be opening up, thank God, uh, next month. So I'll get back into that. Well, um, this is but, this is a good point, which is, you know, we always go, we close these restaurants down. What about the cooks? What about the waitresses? You know, and that kind of stuff. But then all the other people that support. It's a big web. It's a big mm-hmm. web. So it affects the people who do the accounting as well. So 100 percent, 100 percent. And then like the vendors and like, you know, the, <clears throat> the you know, the people that sell wine. And it's just it's way bigger than I think a lot of people realize. Yeah. Um, so, and, but thank God we're going to be going back next month. I'm so excited. Any, so, uh, any, any dating prospects on the horizon, Tony? I do actually have a boyfriend. Um, me and my oh. ex-husband were separated for quite mm-hmm. a long time. So, uh-huh. um, but I do have a boyfriend who doesn't, <laughs> who doesn't understand my, uh, Craigslist selling stuff. <laughs> yeah. Cause he's human. <laughs> But does <laughs> does he have his own pad, or is he living with mom and dad too? I don't want to tell you that. I it's oh my god! If he's at home, <laughs> if he's in the don't house. Don't even. I can't even tell. I he's back oh at god. home. Okay, oh so my he god. he is at home. Oh because, dear lord! <laughs> he lives. combined age one hundred and eleven years old. I know. And it's living so at home. Sad. My life is so, my sister tells me, like, oh my God, my life is so I go, Don't even start with telling me your life is anything. Like <laughs> until you're in my shoes. Then, <laughs> then your life is Yeah, I'm yeah, I, I just uh, How old's your boyfriend? He is fifty okay, so his situation is okay, so he he was married also. Um he has twin boys who are um they're like eleven. Um and so when he got divorced, he wasn't in the situation where he could, you know, uh, get another place. They, you know, they sold the house. So with his boys, he decided that he would live with his mother in the house that um, she has. I'm going to, so his- I'm going to apologize <laughs> to my dad because I used to make fun of him because when he got divorced, he just moved out and moved into his in-laws house in one bedroom and just slept on my grandfather's <laughs> sofa and I thought that was pretty atypical. I thought it was kind of peculiar. I thought it was, you know, a Jim Carolla type move. Right. As I said comically, this makes Drew laugh his ass off because my dad's the kind of guy who has no money and no work ethic, but a lot of pride, you know? Mm-hmm. And when I said to him, why did you live on uh, Grandpa's sofa? Why didn't you get an apartment? He went, I had no money. And I said, right. how old were you? And he's like, 42. And I'm like, why didn't you have any money? He goes, I was a school teacher. Which is supposed to get me to back off because like, oh, I see. Well, the guy was doing something noble. He was volunteering. Is it? No, he wasn't. He was a school teacher. He could have could have had money. Yeah, full time job. Yeah, theoretically. Um, Right. Yeah. How old is this guy? Uh, My boyfriend. Yeah. He's 51. 51. Oh, Robin. Yeah. The reason for staying there was for for his kids, because, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they have the whole, they have a cul-de-sac. They could ride their bikes, you know. Uh, he's living at home. You're living at home. I'm going to put yeah. this delicately. Do you guys fuck <laughs> in a dumpster? Or like, what? where do you actually become intimate? Oh, my God. I know. It's horrible. <laughs> you got your um, dad moving but... down the hall. Oxy <laughs> dandies. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Um. Yeah, we really need to work on this, don't we? <laughs> I, I would say it's a goal. I like that. I hope that your sister's wildly successful and like married to an orthodontist and living in Tiburon. That's that. That's the only thing that would make this story better. It, yeah. Do you see how when I tell you, like, she's telling me, "Oh, my life." This, I'm like, "Don't even start with your life," because, yeah, no, it's uh But you know, I, I'm happy. You really? Know, and that's, Are you? You know. Yeah, I mean, because you know, when I was married, it was it was rough. There's times that it was rough, and I get it. I, th- you know, I'd rather be happy in in this. this it's not permanent. You know, I'm not gonna. This is not a permanent situation. It's Isn't a it? Thing. <laughs> no, I'm just being a dick. <laughs> right. All right. So you, you get along with your parents. <laughs> I do. I love my parents. I hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're great. They're, they're good. They they don't really they don't really you know they don't get in my business and stuff. But yeah, um, I get it. So. Um, all right. So um, I would I would say that your your boyfriend's unemployed as well. 
No, no, he's he has a job. He's been working from home. He he, he can he can definitely he's doing it more for his kids because, um, you know, it's I don't know. I think back to like when I grew up and it was you, you live in a house. You like I don't know. It's just it's different than an apartment. It's not nothing wrong with an apartment or anything, but mm-hmm. um, it just gives them more space and more room. And so he's doing it for that. And so I guess maybe. It, you know, I'm trying to he, picture where you may have met this guy. Like, is there a dating app? Like, silver oh living God, at home singles? Where, it's got to be some him. sort of app for <laughs> dating app for, for adult children that are living at home? No, I met him at a 80s bar. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, the clothespins are five bucks. Right. Hey, everybody. Oh, we got Richard Blade over here. We got Jed the Fish over there. We got Kevin and Bean over there. We got Duran Duran Superset coming your way. Hey, uh, hey, someone, hey, someone hand me that Rubik's Cube. <laughs> this is an 80s bar. Hey, quit your grin and drop your linen. You want to see a bunch of gals that are living at home? We got Jade stage. Oh, Jade. Jade's, Jade's not here. Oh, she's putting together a dad's walker. Oh, she can't. Oh, she can't go out until her dad falls asleep. Okay. All right, she's. All right, she's putting together one of those shower chairs, Rip. Okay. We got other. Um, <clears throat> I say we had a Duran Duran superset. We got soft sale superset coming up. Uh, we got a uh, hazy fantasy superset coming up. And uh, coming to the stage, that's Tony with an eye. Don't worry about it, Jets. <laughs> She's uh, available. And when I say available, I mean available for a home, available for a job, available for a career, available for life, and available for your laugh. <laughs> Who likes close pins? Who's got delicates? They don't want to be machine dry. <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> All right, maybe it's not the demo I'm looking for. Hey, Tony? Yes. <laughs> I think things are going to turn around for you very quickly. I Let's hope see. so. I do hope so. <laughs> and uh, and this new guy, he's gainfully employed doing what? He works at a, um, he, he does, he's in the billing department. He works at a, a big company that puts mm. out, um, uh, I don't even know what they do, honestly. I know. But no, but no woman a, really knows what a man I does. I know. I don't know. He has a job, so that's good. All don't sweat the details. <laughs> all right, baby. Good luck to you selling those clothespins. All right. Thanks so much. You sell uh, <laughs> 7,000 more units of that, and you'll have the cleaning deposit on your first apartment in Pasadena. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> all right, baby. All right. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. See, everyone's got a story. We got Jen over here from uh, Oklahoma, line two. Jen, yes, sir. You have a your raccoon lover. I am. Mm-hmm. True. And uh, what are you selling? Uh, well, I'm actually selling the um, uh, overflow, the multiples. I have a few repeats, and uh, you know, I could part with them. I figured maybe there was someone else out there that. Uh, who's just in love with raccoons as much as me and might enjoy them. Well, why are you parting with your raccoons if you're so in love with raccoons? Uh, well, that is it's a fair question. Um, I, you know, I haven't done a count, but I have a very excessive amount of raccoons. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some I love more than others. You know, what, what's sure. the Marie condo thing if you don't love it you know and some some look a little too much like squirrels and you know maybe it's time for them to go i don't need four of the same and you know maybe someone else needs some some happiness in the form of a raccoon well we're looking at a picture of you right now with a raccoon that looks like he's trying to protect his identity by <laughs> staring into his navel so rac- forgive my extreme ignorance are these live raccoons or these stuffed rac- are these toy raccoons what are we talking about here uh, well, take a look at the, uh, I did send another one. Um, they're uh, all of the above, except for I do not have any live ones. No. So okay. they're everything from stuffed to clothing, to wall art, to knickknacks, wow. to um, desk accessories. Honestly, if it comes in the form of a raccoon, I own it. I bought another mug this weekend. Walmart had a cute raccoon one. So I, I, thought, I, well, I see a person in there <laughs> on the top left. Yep. <laughs> There's a oh yep. there you are buried in your pile of raccoon stuffies. <laughs> yep. 
I don't know. You know, uh, Allie Al and Petey Panda are getting a little worn out. Maybe Sonny would uh, like a new raccoon. You know, yeah. a, a stuffy, as they say. Uh, how does this stuff start? You know, you talked about the mug. I, I feel like this stuff starts when someone gets you a raccoon mug and then people decide. People are lazy. They're always looking <laughs> for an easy Christmas gift. And uh, if you're not a boozer, see, if you're a boozer, then they just get you a bottle of scotch and, you know, everything, everything's good. But then once you get the rack, once you become the raccoon people person, people then get you the stuffed raccoon, the raccoon mug, the raccoon, you know, erasers for the top of your pencils. Where, where do the raccoon things start, Jen? I mean, really, you're 100 percent right. That's exactly what it is. Even I had to question it at you know, maybe uh, five years ago, I realized, gosh, where did I get all these? And sure enough, it just, I became the the girl who likes raccoons and I don't hide it. And so every gift, every holiday or birthday or whatnot was a raccoon. Um, I probably one of, one of the very first stuffed animals that I ever had that I actually remember. I certainly had plenty. Never called them stuffies. I think that sounds weird. But yeah. um, one That's of my very first stuffed thing. animals um, was a raccoon. And uh, and I still I still have him. His, his name is Fluffy, not Stuffy, but Fluffy. Mm. And, uh, you know, I came attached and I think I decided, you know what, raccoons are my thing. So. Is, uh, look yeah. at the top yeah. of the picture we're looking at. We're looking at a, at a myriad of raccoons. At the top, there is a tan, what I can only think is a, 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 a raccoonzy, a, a raccoon beer goozy. Yeah. You see that thing yeah. right yes. at the top center there? <clears throat> yeah. I, have a, mm-hmm. I had a cell phone holder at one point. Uh, no, I think I still have it somewhere. Yeah. Uh, sl- various slippers, hats. Uh, I mean, you name it. It's, nice. I own it. And you're looking to lighten the raccoon load a little bit? The house. Well, this is all I'm really willing to part with. Now, what you didn't see was there is another posting of a couple pieces of wall art, ones that, you know, I bought on impulse because I said, you know, I'm a raccoon lover and I want this. But then I got it home and I said, this is kind of ugly. So, uh, yeah, so some of the some of them I don't love as much as I wanted to love. And it was more out of habit um, um, purchase. But, uh, yeah, I just uh, I hate to go back to this. Well, but uh, single gal. <laughs> I know I like the other gal. Um, I currently am single. I don't blame it on the oh. raccoons, though. I Hold travel on. a lot for Hold work, on. so. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> hey, Jen. Uh, tell us something about the... The uh, hold on, I got a head rush now. So, uh, Jen, do you like the song "Rocky Raccoon" by the Beatles? I don't know that I've heard it. Uh, what? <laughs> what? This is the greatest what? day of my life. This is now the greatest day of my life. What? This is the greatest day of my life. I'm sorry, birth of twins. I also, listen, I also don't. I'm not a huge fan of like the, uh, the trendy raccoon. There's nothing. Right? There's nothing a, you could say. There's there's that. There is I'm no a, words that you could. There, there's I'm no. A, I'm not. I like George Harrison, but I like his a solo work. I didn't like the Beatles when they. There's no words. It's a pleasant song. Your song. Hey, Jen. Yes, that sound, sir. That sound familiar to you? Not at all. So thank you for sharing that and bringing that into my life. I probably this will is never the, This is why again. we have to do <laughs> why the who the F sells this S because it's this dead is classic. Uh, Jen, wait, you. how old are you? I am forty-one. Seems like you're old enough to know uh, the Beatles. Yeah, I'm not a big music person. Is that weird? Yeah. Yeah. What if you collected Beatles? Do you think you'd know about the band, the Beatles? (laughs) The midlife shift. (laughs) Um, Probably. I bet half of the raccoons you own are named Rocky. I don't name them. Just the one. Just the one. Some of them must come with little tags. and tag or something. Charm bracelets that say Rocky on doesn't sound familiar. No, Rocky uh, Raccoon, and not 
Not familiar. <laughs> I'm still wounded by this. Wow. What if, uh, Brian, if, if the Beatles did a song about Paul Newman race cars, do you think I would be aware of them? <laughs> At least have had it brought up to you on probably a couple of occasions. Minimum. Don't you think others, Jen, if you think back on it, have brought up the Beatles' Rocky Raccoon to you? That's the you most know, iconic honest, pop culture. No, nobody has. I'm actually kind of shocked. You're right. Why haven't I heard what? about it? That's a very is there a, Chris, anyone, is there a more iconic pop culture reference to raccoons? No. Yeah, the Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, now yeah, with Rocket. Okay, all right. Yeah, but that's 10 minutes mm-hmm. old. And he was probably named Rocket after Rocky, just with a little probably. alliteration. What do this we need? Raccoons album. are very trendy now, guys. They're it's on the White trendy. Album. Everyone's putting a raccoon in things. What do we need to know? <laughs> but you can't be all things raccoons and not know a song dedicated to raccoons or with the name Rocky Raccoon on the White Album, on the Beatles' White Album. You made that statement. I didn't say all things raccoons. I just told you what I collected as far as, like, objects. Fair. Yeah, you put that. me in my place. <laughs> All right. So, Jen. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. What do we need to know about the majestic raccoon that we don't? You know, are they family oriented? Are their brains, you know, are they, they smarter than a three year old? You know, what do we need to know about the raccoon? Like, technically, marsupials. Yes. Uh, nocturnal. Guys, I'll be honest. Here's the other thing that you're going to probably want to hang up <laughs> she on She knows me. nothing about raccoons. I don't know all the trivia on raccoons. <laughs> yes. Why would you? <laughs> Of course you don't. I don't. I don't. It's not uh, something in my mind. <laughs> like how she's led with nocturnal. Cuddling them and looking at them. <laughs> I'm, Very cute. I'm picturing Jen getting in one of those trivia groups. You, Brian's done this where you you form a little pod of trivia uh-huh. people. Everyone kind of has their strengths. College, You know, Brian would be college sports and sure. uh, things of that nature. Uh, some people know, you know, theater. Yeah, some in theater, and then you're all together, and there's a there's a question about a raccoon, and everyone just looks all at you and goes, "Oh, shit. this is going to be awesome we for the, the for the win." Jen's like, "I I'm wearing a coonskin hat right now, and a raccoon uh, baby Bjorn, but contrary to popular belief, I know nothing about Jen, raccoons. Your house is festooned with <laughs> raccoons. <laughs> yeah." No, all, all of that 100% accurate, except I wouldn't do the coonskin cap. I don't do those. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. That's, she draws, yeah, she's, yeah, that's in poor <laughs> taste. That's in poor taste. Yeah. You must hate Fess Parker. It's a deep Fess cut. Parker. All right. He, I, think he played, I think he played Daniel Boone. And If you're not going to know Rocky mm. Raccoon by the Beatles, I, I don't, I don't no. see. I, I, I think the Fess Parker as a, as a reference is probably a long shot. Davy Crockett. Oh, Damn. Davy Crockett. On, Damn. Daniel Boone. Yeah, Davy Crockett. Well, that was Fess Parker, though, right? But he wore a coonskin hat, didn't he? Famous, Davy Crockett? Famously. Yeah, right? Yeah, All right. Famously. I just picked the, I picked the wrong guy. All right, but it was Fess. Uh, let's see. Rare alien mask, $6. Ghostbusters <laughs> keychain. Now, I don't, know, I don't know how we recover from Jen. <laughs> it's going to be difficult. Um, Michael's in Culver City, so he's local, Brian. Oh, I must almost swing by his place. You still have that Ghostbusters keychain I got you for your 40th birthday? Yeah, it's hanging my keys right now, yeah. Oh, okay. I've mean, used right. it a lot well, of COVID, you can imagine. St- yeah, I understood. Hey, uh, Michael? Yep, right here. Thank you. You got a Ghostbusters keychain? Yeah, it sounds like I'm not. it's not too out of the ordinary if you've already given one of the gifts. Uh eh, Brian loves the Ghostbusters. Oh, I'm, I'm this, pr- yeah. This is the 35th anniversary one, Adam. You just got me a generic one. This is the 35. With a bottle opener worked into it, right? Big time. Yeah, the bottle opener. I, I mean, this was part of. I don't know if uh, you know anyone was for, uh, in attendance at the Sony Studios 35th anniversary Ghostbusters fan fest. Mm. Did, you just walk, did, did you just walk down there, uh, uh, Michael? I mean, you, you're in Culver City. It's very close to Sony oh. Studios. Cul- Culver City is very long, as you know. It goes from Fairfax all the way. You know, So uh, we weren't exactly walking distance, but ah. uh, it was close. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, this was part of, like, the VIP package, you know, a bunch of swag and, and merch included, and it's a very nice, nice uh, or generous kind of um, 
a gift that was provided. And I realized after sitting on it for like two years, you know, I'm like, this is better off with someone who could actually put it to use. Of the, all the items we got, I think we only like framed a poster and, and did some other stuff with it. My, my son is enamored with all things Ghostbusters. We're looking forward to the movie this summer. So um, obviously that's been delayed, but, you know, probably try to see it in one form or another. How, how uh, were you with the all ladies Ghostbusters? Uh, it's it's pretty low on on the Ghostbusters hierarchy. Um, mm-hmm. I I appreciated that. I thought it looked great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't think that the uh, you know script or you know what they did with it mm. lived up to maybe the first two. Mm. But you know that it's all subjective. So don't don't hold me to it or whatever. Um, all right. So uh, Michael, it, yes. it's been it's been a tough day over here. Please tell me you know who Bill Murray is. <laughs> Well, yeah, but Bill wasn't, I mean, I call him Bill, or Mr. Murray, uh, wasn't in attendance at the uh, oh. fan fest, unfortunately. Oh. He, he, I guess he's a you know, particularly contentious one when it comes to, like, the reunions. But, um, you know, we did get to meet Dan Aykroyd, and, you know, I overheard you asking some of the other listeners about, you know, their marital status or whatnot. And I am married, and my wife and I met at the House of Blues in Hollywood, uh, which Dan Aykroyd was, you know, fa- wow. founding partner of. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, we were able to kind of informally, you know, thank him, so to speak, for us coming together. And we've been married 10 years now and have a son. So, who, uh, you know. We'll go out on a high note, but who was playing at the House of Blues when you met your woman? Galactic, New Orleans band. Oh, nice. Oh, very nice. All right, thanks, uh, Michael. Good luck uh, unloading that bad boy. And I would, uh, it says Ghostbusters keychain. I'd, I'd work bottle opener into it, too. Yeah. It's got some uh, utility. All right, outro. I'm still reeling from Rocky Raccoon. Yeah, me too. Oh, that's who the fuck sells this shit. All right, well, Wayne Fetterman's going to come on. We're going to talk all about stand-up because he's written a book about it and he teaches classes on it as well. First, I'll tell you about uh, Geico. Do you own? Do you rent? Hmm... What about it? Uh, That's your home. Then what about your automotive policy? Well, you can get it all done with GEICO. When you get your bundle on, GEICO makes it easy to bundle. And uh, speaking of uh, GEICO and uh, owning and road trips and uh, hitting the road, we'll tell you a little about uh, one of our stories. Max Paddle, what do we got? We're talking about uh, taking a road trip. with You and I uh, took a nice little road trip. So we both went to Naples, Florida to do some to do some shows out there and then uh but our, our wait friend- did we go to naples i don't think we went to naples oh it's palm beach uh, we went to palm, palm beach, beach excuse went me. back to naples yeah we went back to, we've been to florida a couple of times <laughs> yeah i know so we went to palm beach and then your old assistant rob was actually getting married out there on the beach so you and i we sent august back home and you and i took the rental car just us two for a nice scenic drive down the uh, florida coast down the keys Romantic. And uh, and I got I got to drive, which personally I was a little nervous about doing because I've I, I obviously want to drive uh, in a very uh, essential like uh, because I don't I want to say you're picky with with how people drive, but I want to make sure that He's you know particular. that yeah that 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 I'm paying attention. So I'm um, and I don't <laughs> think I've ever driven you for as long as I've known you in the ten plus years that we've we've been here. That was the first time that I realized it there. So you got you were you were handling the tunes. We listened to the entire Jayhawks discography. Yeah, and uh, and it was cool just driving down the coast and being able to look left and right and just as far as you can see is ocean and water and Gulf, whatever it was. So it, it was kind of surreal being able to do that. I felt stupid because I kept seeing signs for Key Lime Pine. I was like, they invented Key Lime, and like we're in the Keys. That's yeah, they invented so. Key Lime oh, Pie. Oh yeah, yeah. Every everywhere has signs for Key Lime Pie. Famous. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and uh, it was such a nice wedding. It was totally worth the drive. I mean, we could have we could have figured out a way to to fly there or something. But I thought the drive was the right move. Yeah, the ride back at uh, five in the morning was probably a little more difficult after staying up and partying all night with <laughs> yeah. Rob and his wife. But uh, the ride there was uh, romantic. And, uh, yeah, take a road trip, people. I mean, there's some places you got to fly to, but other places are kind of a coin toss where you go, we could fly, we could drive. Yeah, drive. Now's the time. Yeah, now's time. Have a good conversation, listen to good music, and then see some see some, see America, man. Yeah, soak it in. Get some key lime pie. 
I uh, I concur. All right. Uh, so go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see uh, just how much you could be saving when you get your bundle on at because uh, they make it easy. At Geico, that is Geico.com. All right. We'll talk to uh, Wayne Fetterman, who's all things uh, comedy. He's an actor. He's a writer. He's a podcaster. He's a musician. He's a comedian. We'll talk to him about uh, the history of stand-up right after this. Adam Carolla's I'm Your Emotional Support Animal, navigating our all-woke, no-joke culture, has over a thousand five-star reviews on Amazon. Here's one. I feel great in the song loud. I know that I know along and this is good about the hypersensitive world in you are. Well said. Pick up I'm Your Emotional Support Animal, navigating our all-woke, no-joke culture, and leave your five-star review on Amazon. Get all the links at adamcarolla.com. Wayne Fetterman has joined us. Uh, He's been in movies such as Knocked Up, 40-Year-Old Virgin, Step Brothers, Funny People, Legally Blonde, and TV shows like Curb Your Enthusiasm, my favorite, Crashing, second favorite, Larry Sanders Show, oh, that's in there, Silicon Valley, Community. All the good stuff as well. And it's got a book out, The History of Stand-Up from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle, available now on Amazon. And it chronicles the evolution of stand-up pre-vaudeville days to today. Good to see you, Wayne. Hey, man. Nice to see you, Ed. Yeah, let's talk about uh, stand-up. Where, uh, well, here's a question for a guy who teaches stand-up and studies mm-hmm. stand-up. I always kind of liken things to the heavyweight boxing division. You know, you had the Foreman and Ali days of Joe Frazier and all these great days. And then you had these weird days with guys like Ronaldo Snipes and uh, Michael Spinks and, you know, some names that weren't really legendary names. So it was kind of a low time for heavyweight boxers. And then it kind of went up again with the Klitschko's and Lennox Lewis. Where are we with stand up? How would you? If you chart it, you think about the eighties and the nineties. I know. Some I, of those names. I the the problem with that question. I'm already attacking the question. <laughs> um, it's uh, is that in boxing, there's a clear winner. Like somebody wins either on points or they knock the other person out. Whereas stand up, it's completely subjective on who is funny, who isn't funny, and what I say in the book unfortunately, is that stand-up does not age well. It's very much a generational thing. So it's even hard to compare. Like, I mean, there's a few that sort of transcend, obviously, Richard Pryor and Carlin are a couple examples of that. But it's just hard. It's hard to even compare era to era. And even who was the best of that era? So um, but so I, I try not to get into that. I try not to get into that. I think we can agree <laughs> that that when, means that you want me to agree with no, you. I no, but you talk to some of these guys and they'll go like, I don't know, talk to Byron Allen or somebody. And they'll go like, yeah. when I was at the comedy store, when I got there, there was Jay Leno and David Letterman and uh, Seinfeld or whomever, you know, that's like a mm-hmm. who's who of sort of um, royalty of, right. of comedy and, you know, now it's I don't know how history is going to view it, but it, it, it doesn't feel as household. You know, it's got this me and Mark something... Mariner back there, you know, and it's like, <laughs> who cares? I, I don't look who know You might be right. You might be right. But I do feel a lot of it is like the first time you see these stand ups when you're a younger person, it is sort of like this huge kind of it's almost like a magic trick they're doing. You're just like amazed by the whole thing. And then when you're around it for a few years, it's harder to impress you with that. Maybe yeah, that's a good answer. Thank well, you. What are, uh, let's talk about teaching. <sighs> let's talk about teaching. Oh uh, yeah. The worst. I think I took, <laughs> I took a stand up class. I, I rarely what? ever talk about it when I was like 19. I was like uh-huh. some professor at UCLA had some sort of thing at night or something. And I only UCLA extension half. perhaps. Yeah. Oh yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't able to go We're to on UCLA. Camp. We're a lot on campus. <laughs> it was on campus though, oh, but it was no, like an extension thing. Yep. And this guy was teaching Sand. I, I don't know what you can teach a 19 year old about, about okay, stand-up. Can I, Go. This is something yes. I've said before that you can't teach someone to be funny. Obviously, that's a given, right? Yes. So, uh, 
but out of that class, at least did you go like, oh, I'm I'm like the funniest guy in this class, at least. Didn't you get did you get any kind of like, oh, at least I'm on the track somewhere. This is a safe environment where I can kind of just as opposed to just throw myself into an open mic. Did that happen? I uh, later on when I was with the groundlings, when mm-hmm. I was taking groundlings classes, I was like, oh, I am subjectively funnier than most of these people. I have no idea what I'm doing, but right. I but I'm I think I'm funnier than a lot of these people. Right. And you can get a sense of that. You can get a sense of someone who just cannot. And I have believe me, I teach them a <laughs> lot. They just have no they're not even close. They're not even close to the pool. Well, is it? Is it's it, like a huge pool and they're like walking in the other direction. Is, they, they can't even see it. Is this a safe statement then? <laughs> uh, there's people that teach like self-defense classes, you know, yes. and they're not going to turn the spindly middle-aged woman into a cage fighter, but she'll be better if someone attacks her on the street than before mm-hmm. she took the class. Is that a fair statement? Yes. She'll have like a couple like counter moves or skills or confidence to grab the guy's balls or whatever. Right. I'm assuming she's being attacked by a guy. I don't know if that's wrong. So, yeah. So what is. uh, Don't be gender presumptive. I'm I'm, I'm the worst. (laughs) What are uh, what. So let's let's say you get presumptive. Well, you got Dawson over here. Engineer Dawson. Dawson's going to be doing some stand up with me and that's going to be jam in the van speakeasy March 25th. I'll give a plug out there. And uh, I love it. He's going to be opening, doing a few minutes for me. Um, what are some, you know, he's, he's done a little bit. He's pretty good on his feet. He's got some mic time, but not a lot of stand up time. What is, uh, what are some tips for like a young comedian has got to get his first five minutes together? Well, I, this is what I always say. I said, there's nothing, there's no, nothing I can teach you that's better than stage time, right? There's not, there's no Fetterman magic trick where all of a sudden like, oh, oh my God, I'm writing John Mulaney jokes. This is incredible. Right. Uh, So I tell them that's the first thing that the most important thing is to get on stage as much as possible. And then I just teach them like uh, just basic writing things. Like three of the things that I go over and over and over again is just, clarity brevity and specificity like is mm-hmm. those are three things they can kind of wrap their heads around when they're writing a bit they're like is this as brief and as clear as specific as possible and i think for the most part there's exceptions and most most great stand-up falls into that there's not a lot of loose language around it you've been doing it so it's just like that that's kind of yeah they it's only $58,000 a year to go there. So it's well worth those <laughs> well, three tips. What Wayne's alluding to, I assume, Wayne, correct me if I'm wrong, you teach at USC. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I went to USC. I would have oh. loved the class like yours you know, Why? 20 years ago when I was there. Uh, talk about, I want to know first, how, did you pitch the class to them or did they come to you? And also, how do you grade? Well, what, what, is, the, what is the determining factor in the grade? Well, here's the, all great questions. First of all, can I ask you, why would you take that class as a it, student? It sounds fun. It sounds like if I'm just doing elective, I assume it's an elective. I can't imagine it. Is it part of a core curriculum? It can be. There's a, there is like a, a comedy like a minor. Element? There is a comedy minor that it um, could be part of that. Okay. Well, if, as an as a, uh, um, elective, it sounds like a lot of fun. And yeah. I would have probably, I took a improv class back at USC. It was like improv and theater games stopped by like a professional clown, like a guy who did clowning. And yep. so it was a lot more movement than it was improv as we know it but it was still fun were there hats involved were there, there were no hats noses? there was a lot of movement a lot of sti- a lot of gesticulating but anyway <laughs> to, to, feel free to answer the questions okay my my answer to your question is how do i grade them yeah here was how, the how does one thing. get an a in a comedy class okay you just show up to the class and participate okay here's the the insane part of it unlike writing where there is some subjectivity to it, mm-hmm. I was told right off the bat, like, you cannot judge on talent. You cannot grade on talent. Really? Yeah. You have to grade on effort and participate by being yeah. there. Obviously. Yeah, yes. Let that sink in, people. Let it sink in. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how much of uh, a great stand-up or just a stand-up we like is a certain uh, je ne sais quoi, a certain just 
we like this person. They seem comfortable in their own skin. Maybe Nate Bargatze. Do you know him? He's yeah. coming on in a few days. Nate's he coming. is. Oh, I think he's incredible. He's coming on tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a. Uh, that's an that's a good plug for the show. So that's thanks. a strange question. Nate Bargatze. I had no has, idea. I no, I didn't know what your schedule. Yeah, was. he has a kind of a he has a comfort. You know, I think I think Dave Chappelle has a comfort. I mean, all the great guys sort of have a a comfort. A for, quiet confidence to it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, unless you're going to go kind of a Gilbert Godfrey, like which a Richard kind of Lewis kind of thing, own mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. you know, so much of it seems to just be about a kind of a humanistic quality almost like like I'll, I'll i'll make this statement you tell me if you agree okay. i i think if you seem uncomfortable uh you're gonna have a real hard time landing great jokes if you seem uncomfortable it on uh, conversely if you seem very comfortable lesser jokes will land absolutely i i tell them the whole and that's why what goes back to what i said earlier is that you can only kind of get that comfortableness with stage time, in my right. opinion. Like very few. There's a few. Eddie Murphy, there's a few that like out of the gate have this next level quiet confidence about them. But usually it's something you're like, oh, this is the rhythm of this is my thing. But mm. to tell you the truth, honestly, I do feel like what you said is right on, spot on, that the humanity behind the comic is just as important as the specific jokes. Yeah. And also I think what, what ends up happening is at the beginning part of your career, even before it's a career, just you get up on stage. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of like a first date, like all the things (laughs) that you shouldn't do, you're compelled to do on the first date but they're all the wrong things to do. Like you get a little nervous. So you start talking too much and then you start talking about yourself too much. And then you start trying to build yourself up. It's, it's always the best is sit back, ask her questions, let her course, talk about herself. Course. Like you even take something, you take something like dry mouth or sweating, like all the things you don't want to do on stage, get a dry mouth, sweat, right. your know, forehead starts beating up. It's all what happens when you get pushed into this situation. And I think right. a lot of people, when they're beginning, feel pressured. And when they feel that pressure, they speed it up. Like they start talking faster. And uh, and then if you're not getting laughs, you'll speed it up even more, trying to like push out more jokes, thinking, you know, you're going to make up for it. The reality is, is when you really slow it down, the audience will just stay with you. They're they're actually get more engaged when you slow it down. Yeah, I don't. I mean, Brian, I don't know if you do you do stand up as well. I had a very brief and specific stand up career in 2019. Oh. I've never done stand up, <laughs> but I was hosting a jo- a big benefit for uh, young adult cancer, and so right. I over the course of about a year, I took a stand up class. I learned stand up. I did I I did open mics. I hosted a couple oh, of small okay. things, and I performed a. 12 ish minute set that I had worked on for about a year. So I guess, I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for. No, no, no. I was just, I was just curious about it because I don't know if you or Adam have had that exactly what you're describing where things aren't going well. Mm, Yeah. And then you race to these punchlines thinking, God, if I can just get to this punchline, get this laugh, I can get this thing back on track and they can smell, they just can smell it. I feel like audiences are just like, they don't they're uncomfortable for your uncomfortableness Mm -hmm. and it just unravels in the worst possible way that's been my experience yeah it's like Uh, tripping in a race it's like it's hard to recover yeah it's 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 easier when you're racing but yeah you uh i've gone full zola bud oh there was a deep trip race reference got to be specific that's good. Can't yeah, you sit. learned one of the three, the Fetterman three. <laughs> the Fetterman <laughs> three was Zola oh, Bud. Uh, call the raccoon gal and see if she's heard of Zola oh, Bud, Brian. Right? That's a, it's it's a unlikely. It's a real deep cut, Wayne. So, um, in the book, let's get to the book. Sorry, uh, the yeah. history. No, no, no. I I like talking about how ridiculous it is, how ridiculous it is. But I will say that a lot of times I bring in comics to the class to speak to them. 
And they're like, oh, yeah, I took a comedy class. I took a stand up class when I started. Like Margaret Cho did that. Jeff Ross did that. You know, it was like I was like, I was really surprised how many people are just like, OK, this is a great, great way to get into like into the pool, as I call it. Well, you know, as I think about it, <clears throat> yeah. I do love automobile racing and everyone who races cars, most of many of them started off in like a high performance driving school or something. They, they went right. to school for it. You know, you, you think of it as, Oh, your dad ran moonshine and he you know, handed you <laughs> right. the keys to the mercury or something. But a lot of people went sort of traditional routes and right. you know, why isn't, you know, comedy's a lot of soul and sort of, invisible stuff and pixie dust and stuff, but it's also a lot of technique and there's, there's, I've learned, I learned from doing improvisational humor that there are rules for improvisational humor. When you go to the groundlings, they teach you the rules. Many radio people and other people I've had to deal with over the years could have benefited greatly mm. from, you know, yes. And, and not only that, but, God yes, knows, yeah. Bonaducci could have learned from <laughs> Cynthia Segetti way back in the day. But again, the Fetterman Three. I love that you're using all of my techniques. There's a, uh, <laughs> I call it the Segetti Four. But okay, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, but but there is a base. I mean, you can go off and vamp and be funny and do right, all the right. characters you want, but it is good to get that base underneath you first yes not only right. that but what you were alluding to there are plenty in fact people listening to the show the majority of probably improvisational comedians you know and listen to still take classes after they've become sort of known entities actors still take acting classes after they become working actors like just it's like a workout you know and it means a place right. to go and hit the heavy the comedic heavy bag well it's yeah i mean obviously I'm kind of ju trying to justify this job I have at USC, <laughs> but it's, uh, but there, I think there is some value. Oh yeah. I just don't know oh, if it's $58,000. Sure. <laughs> I would have loved to have that class. <laughs> well, the book, anyway, the history of standup, um, yeah. it says from Mark Twain. Now most people yeah. think of him as like a humorist, I guess. Do you think of him right. as a standup? Well, it's, I define standup as somebody standing alone on stage, getting laughs without, like music or, you know, without a, a partner, without a ventriloquist dummy. And what kind and of, what, what, what kind of uh, venues would Mark Twain do? What, how would he well, do that? Well, this is the thing. I even go back pre, there's a guy that he saw do uh, what they were called comedy lectures at that time. Mm -hmm. But there was a guy he saw that inspired him to do this tour. And uh, it was mainly theaters it was mainly theaters and like banquet halls. And it was all over the world. It was Hungary. It was Austria. It was England. It was France. It was it was incredible what he was able to do before there was ever any air travel or anything. And he made a ton of money. That's why he did it, to tell you the truth, because he had been famous from these books. And then he lost a bunch of money in a startup mm -hmm. and then he was broke. And it was like, oh, I can do what Artemis, this dude, Artemis Ward, who I was talking about, I can do what that is and charge a buck a person. And that's how he got rich again. Wow. And did he, yes. like, would he do, he would do stories, anecdotes, like mm -hmm. it wouldn't be like a tight set. Like we. It would not about be him. like a tight set, but the guy he watched, here was his technique. This is Artemis Ward, the guy that Mark Twain saw and was like, oh, this is how I can do it. He would he there was something called the Lyceum movement, which was was like I, adult education in theaters, like people would pontificate on botany or uh, or American <laughs> Revolution or the just, TED talks would, of their day. Yes, exactly. Right. It was like an hour TED talk and people would pay to go see this because there wasn't, you know, big public education at the time. So. So this guy, I'm Artemis. I'm sorry, Wayne, what year would this be like? Where this Artemis would be, this is around. The mid 1800s, a little bit before the Civil War, like there's sort of a growing middle class mm -hmm. in the United States. And so he uh, so there's this Lyceum movement, huge movement. So this guy, Artemis Ward, has already got a reputation of being a funny dude for these funny newspaper articles that he wrote. And so he was like, oh, I can put this on stage. So he had his his thing was called stories 
of the baby or something like that. And then he went on stage, but the whole time, the hour and 20 minutes, that's what he did. Never mentioned stories of the baby. Like his whole thing was like, I'm going to get to it. I a thing. I, here's a, a, a tangent. Here's a, and he did it in a very deadpan style. Like, I don't know what you people are laughing at. I'm, I'm going to get to this. So that was his technique. Twain sees him and is like, and writes about him. He's like, this guy Artemis is a genius. And that's how it kind of, that's, that was one of the, what I call the forefathers of stand up. So those two guys, definitely. And no amplified sound then. Nope. Just mm -hmm. acoustics, right? Right. And and then Twain, would he do, do we have, you know, transcripts nope. of his stuff or? Oh, I don't know if we have transcripts. We don't have any audio recording of him. Right. None of Artemis, none of Twain. And there's only very little footage of Twain. So, um, yeah, so they're just, but the, the, the reaction he got everywhere he went, all over the country. I have it in the book, like his tour dates in December, 1869, like what he did in December that month, like all the theaters he played. And it was almost like a lot of times it was every night, then we'd take a day off. It was just like a comic store. It's kind of weird as I think about it. Yeah. That we had photographs and movies 75 years before we had audio recording, right? No, 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 no. That would be weird. But it would be weird. But I mean, they talk about an audio track to like a, to like motion picture that took a while. You're talking about synchronized sound to a movie. Yeah, I mean, just like oh yeah, like like they shellacked records, of, you know, in the 1800s. But yep. but we had yep. like we had video. Sorry, video. We had motion, whatever video of Mark Twain, but we didn't have yes. any audio. Correct. Of him, I mean, it wasn't readily about. You could go to one of his events and like film it, but you couldn't record it. Or how come there's no audio then of, of well, like Mark the, Twain? The footage of Twain is like from the early 1900s and it's just him in his house. And I think at the time he was like very worried about people exploiting him. So there was I think he was very careful about not doing any record. He could have. There was recordings, but none, no live recordings. But yeah. there were comedians at the time in the late 1800s. There's a famous guy named Uncle Josh who did, uh, you know, Uncle Josh. We all have an Uncle Josh. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he had a bunch of records that he sold and they were just, but he did it in a studio and he would just do his like, you yeah. would refer to them as humorists, like humorous stories about New England kind of thing. So Twain would get up there and would he do an hour, hour and yep. 20 minutes? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> and and like it was people went all over the world, like we went nuts for this guy. And he was once in a while, he got to the point where he was like in the middle of the show, he might do something sad like mm -hmm. uh, Hannah Gadsby style. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then go back to it, you know, because he wanted to prove that he had like a little bit of a, a range. Mm -hmm. So he would do some melancholy stuff. Sometimes you read from the book and then he tell a little story and it, and people went nuts for Twain. You should check out. Um, there's a good documentary on him. What's it's the it guy called? that does all the documentaries. Um, Ken Burns. Yes. Ken Burns. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Burns has a really good about those tours and how incredible they were. But again, no one was calling a stand up. I don't want to make it seem like, oh, they're like, oh, he's doing stand up. Right. And he's doing an open mic and now he's doing this thing. It was a whole different, but he was, that's what, what, what he was doing. When was stand up codified as we know it? When did it sort of become 40, 1947? The term stand up came to be. Is that Catskills or is that somewhere else? It was more, it was part, partly of the Catskills, but it was more, I mean, there's a number of uh, ideas of where it came from, but I think the our overarching one, it was a shorthand for bookers to book a certain wow. kind of act that didn't okay. need music cues, didn't need lighting cues, just needed a microphone. They could throw him out there and he would just do jokes, stand up. That's it. Like even Bob Hope could like, oh, I'll do a, a duet with this girl and I'll do a comedy bit with Jerry Colonna and then I'll do 10 minutes of stand up. Like wow. it was a specific kind Dang. of thing you could do. 
God, it is fascinating. It, uh, I don't know why I'm going down the Mark Twain rabbit hole. No, here, let's keep going there. I love how, it. When did he die? How old did he? I just picture sort of old Mark the Twain. Great. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Um, I, it, early 1900s. Um, I, I don't know the exact date. Is this 1910? 1910, okay. says uh, Chris. Where does Will Rogers kind of work oh, into this? Well, if, in the book, I have four forefathers. They are Artemis Ward, that guy you just heard about. Mm -hmm. He's the one that inspires Twain, who's become so much more famous than Artemis Ward. Oh, Artemis I'm, Ward is still at the comedy store. I've, I've gone. <laughs> no, no, I think you. Who am I thinking of? Oh, Angus. You're thinking of, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Well, he's still um, at it. That's, yeah, yeah. That's my point. And the then <laughs> there was a guy named Burt Williams who came out of, did a little, mint, came out of the minstrel show. He's an African American dude. And then Will Rogers is the fourth. So Will Rogers is huge, huge, because he was the first one to do straight on political, topical material. It was a lot more gentle than it is now where you kind of eviscerate the person. Mm -hmm. But so anyone that does politics on stage, so that's Carson, that's Bob Hope, that's Mort Saul, that's any of the SNL yeah. uh, Weekend Update Bill dudes. Maher. Bill Mars couldn't be a bit John, you know. So yeah, all of those guys. You know, it's weird about Will Rogers is tell me. I was literally driving through. <laughs> tell a, the guy who wrote the book. I will tell you because this is <laughs> this has more to do with real estate. But I was driving yeah. through uh, the canyon yesterday and I saw Will Rogers State yeah. Park mm -hmm. up in Santa yeah. Monica. Will Rogers Beach yeah. down there, and I and I thought, what's his connection to Santa Monica? <laughs> Like he must have been a SoCal guy. I, I don't know why they named that stretch of beach. You know, as you he head owned in, all that land, he owned oh, all of that land. Yeah. Cause oh, as you point. head into Malibu, if you were driving from Santa Monica down PCH into Malibu, you would cross Will Rogers state now. beach. And there's a Will Rod. When I was God, 22, I had a motorcycle and I went on a date. I remember going up to, you go down Sunset before it spills out into PCH and you turn yeah. up the driveway and it's a Will Rogers State Park up there. So he had all that land. Yeah, and he donated it. when He, he was extremely successful. And now it's, it's, yeah, people kind of know about him, but his story is phenomenal. He was Cherokee. He was half Cherokee. Really? And- Born in what became Oklahoma, then known as Indian Territory, learned how to rope as a kid. And that's how he got into show business as something. Remember, we were talking about the Lyceum circuit, like mm -hmm. the Lyceum thing that uh, Twain and Artemis did. He got in something that was called Wild West shows, which were mm. traveling shows They're like a circus. And they would like, you know, rope and then the. Cowboy boots, Indian reenactments, and Bronco things, and shooting, and I'm sure you heard of Annie Oakley. She was part of that whole sure. thing. Yeah. So uh, that's how he got started before he talked, before he ever talked on stage. Uh, Wayne Fetterman. Leo Carrillo State Beach. How funny was Leo Carrillo? <laughs> <laughs> the next beach you hit is Leo right. Carrillo. <laughs> <That's> hilarious. <laughs> Did he no, use Zuma, I tell you, Zuma was was incredible. He was a mime. Zuma was Zuma a mime. Zuma was a mime. Yeah, it goes, it <laughs> goes Will Rogers, Malibu, whatever, Leo Carrillo and whatever. So, God, he must have bought that some of the most expensive real estate on the planet. He must have bought that for pennies an right. acre. I mean, yeah. were we talking about the 20s? When were we, when were we talking Before, about? I think he, he bought that land in the 20s because he was a big movie star he was a big radio star he had a he, the most important thing was he had this newspaper column that he wrote every day with like stuff so he was that had books tours toured the world he was like a machine we would we, uh, we would have me to the shit out of these guys oh, yeah. if they were alive today <laughs> oh, yeah, of course of course, of course. <laughs> will rogers and uh leo mark carrillo twain. No, <laughs> mark twain they'd be running for their fucking lives their their publicists would be delivering prepared statements they'd be in semi-seclusion they'd probably all have to move to france at right. this point when did will rogers pass do you remember well will rogers 1835. No, 1935. Me. 1935. No, he died in a horrific plane crash in. Oh, uh, that's right. 
in Alaska with this uh, other guy, Wiley Post, who was this sort of crazy, you know, uh, aviator who created the spacesuit. He like so anyway, he dies, and it is all the flags, federal property, half mast. Wow! All the day of his funeral, NBC, CBS radio, no television yet, obviously stops broadcasting for like 10 minutes at us. They stop all the movies, stop for two minutes, 1200 movie theaters across the country. It is, it's devastating. I can't believe it would be like, I don't even know if there's Beyonce. any. <laughs> well, a national treasure. Yes, it was a national treasure. It was a big thing when he died. So uh, yeah, and, and it was, was like, and, and the horrificness of it, just like, because that's when like people were just thinking, is this air travel? Is this going to be a thing? Are we uh, like, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, probably. So it was, it yeah. was horrific. Howard, and Howard Hughes was pissed. And can I also say something that's very interesting about Will Rogers to me, oh. probably not to you, but he was the first comedian to host the Academy Awards. Oh, oh. how about that? That's some twin trivia. Wow, and how how long did uh, how long had the Academy Awards been going? They started in twenty nine. He did it in thirty three. So he did maybe the fourth one. Wow, that's interesting. The, yeah, a downtown uh, Los Angeles, and then Is then he available be this year. <laughs> well, now yeah. they can't get anyone speaking because they had because you have to have a Twitter account and the so yeah. yeah but that started the tradition of Bob Hope and all of those guys right up through Billy Crystal and Ellen DeGeneres. How, how old was Will when he died? Do you remember? It says can, here we'll, 55. So I'm going to guess 55. That's off the top of my head. That's <laughs> out of me want to log a guess? Yeah, I don't uh, <laughs> want to log in. Probably older again. than 50, younger than 60. I don't know. I'll just, I'm, the a, I'm an odd numbers man. So I'll just, I'll go right in the middle. I'll go 55. <laughs> the double nickel, the double nickel. <laughs> All right. Well, all very uh, interesting <laughs> stuff. Uh, Wayne, you want to hang out and do news with us? I'd love to. I'd love to. In the spirit of Murrow, Jennings, Cronkite, here's another great moment in local news. Some people in the Crichton area of Mobile say a leprechaun has taken up residence in their neighborhood. A leprechaun. NBC 15's <laughs> Brian Johnson has more. Curiosity leads to large crowds in Mobile's Crichton community, many of you bringing binoculars, camcorders, even camera phones to take pictures. To me, it looked like a leprechaun to me. I got to do a look up in the tree. Who else in the leprechaun say yeah? yeah! yeah! Eyewitnesses say the leprechaun only comes out at night. If you shine a light in its direction, it suddenly disappears. That's a great moment in local news. Now, back to the Adam Carolla Show. Well, Dawson's going to be filling in for Gina Grad, and uh, Wayne Federman's hanging in, and so is Bald. So take it away, Dawson. Mike Dawson with the news. Nice. Wow. So let's begin here. Uh, broadcasters, uh, mainly in the Los Angeles area, but really nationwide, are mourning the loss of legendary sportscaster Steve Grad, who passed away on uh, March 16th. Fellow broadcaster Jack Salvatore, who uh, worked with uh, Mr. Grad for many years, said, Hell of a ride through the roller coaster of life with the sweetest, kindest, most compassionate, loyal, friendliest, and most dedicated to family, most professional, smartest, strongest, most adventurous, funniest, and downright good person I've ever known. I'm blessed that you put up with me through all the, for all these years. Wayne Federman, that's Gina Grad's father, who just uh, passed oh, away I, suddenly. Is that why she's not here? Yes, famous sportscaster. So Steve uh, Grad worked on KX 1070, uh, doing the sports reports from 93 to 2016. He was also on KTLA. Also worked at K101 in San Francisco uh, for a period of the 80s. And then Kansas City, San Antonio, and Portland. And he will be missed in the radio community. All right. The uh, final day for collecting signatures to recall Governor California Governor Gavin Newsom uh, is today as we record this. It is over uh, the recall. People say that they have enough signatures uh, for the recall to go through, but there are still several hurdles. First, 
Signatures need to be verified. There's also a thing where they allow people 30 days to withdraw their signature. So the recall people do expect that a Democratic campaign is going to come out in the next few days, urging Democrats to remove their signatures of, of, of those two million. Still quite a few hoops to go through. They say the earliest a recall uh, election could happen uh, would be in October, possibly November, but it's going to be all at the whim of the bureaucratic process. Max Zapata, do we have his commercial somewhere? Yeah, he was uh, now... Newsom's Newsom's having to sort of get up and burn some calories now. <laughs> now he's fighting for his job. I uh, this whole notion that uh, well, w- what if we get somebody worse than Newsom? Well, who's worse than Newsom? Number one, number oh, two. Watch your tongue. We could we could get the plastic owl that's on top of the seafood restaurants <laughs> to keep the seagulls from shitting on the sign, and that would be a a step toward the light. In terms of replacing Gavin Newsom, but Newsom, uh, we'll play the we'll play the commercial. Um, we have the one of does he have the QAnon one in there? Yeah, so this is a whole new campaign he uh, launched on awesome. Monday. So we'll uh, we'll take a look. Oh at that. God, QAnon, everybody. Who's behind the partisan recall of Governor Gavin Newsom? Same Anti-vaccine people. QAnon extremists. Violent white supremacists like oh, the Proud Boys geez, who attacked our nation's capital on January 6th. And the same right-wing Republican politicians who supported Donald Trump's attempt to overturn the election. Of course, paid for by the Republican National Committee. Instead of helping fight the pandemic, national Republicans are coming to fight Californians. Add your name to help stop the Republican recall. It's All a power right. grab. Yeah. Well, it's it's a power grab, like taking a retarded nine-year-old out of the driver's seat of a pickup truck is a power grab. Yes, right. that would be a power grab. That's true. Hey, Timmy, no, no. No, no, give me the keys. You're going to hurt somebody. Yes, that's a power grab, like taking a pistol away from a from a severely disabled three-year-old that that would be if that's if that's the power grab we're talking about then so be it i love the fact that we get to blame QAnon on everything now like this is a QAnon conspiracy this QAnon thing is the greatest fucking thing that ever happened it's everything that that you don't like you just go that's QAnon conspiracy white supremacists everything is race can it be that you're just a feckless fuck up can that be it? And you're fucking running the state into the ground? Could it be that? That Listen, Elon Musk, uh, if I'm running the campaign against Gavin Newsom, I just go, who's the smartest man on the planet? Elon Musk. Where do you still live? California. Where does he live now? <laughs> okay. Smartest guy on the planet left. That's all I need to know. That's Newsom all. is definitely on a full media blitz. He appeared on The View a couple of days ago. Oh, I'd like to play you a, a small little clip from Newsom's appearance there. It begins with uh, Joy Behar asking him a question, and he does an expert piece of politicking to tell you once again who is behind this recall. So um, President Biden has directed states to make all adults eligible for the vaccine by May 1st. But a new poll found nearly half of Trump supporters, 47 percent, won't take it. Okay, California has a long established anti-vaccine movement. If vaccines are the key to getting back to normal, how will you convince anti-vaxxers to get the shot? Can you mandate it also? No, I mean, it's the right question. And by the way, it's the anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers, not just the mega Trump donors and the Newt Gingriches and Mike Huckabees and Devin Nunes's, in addition to the conspiracy theorists and militia members that are behind this recall. So- yeah. What about people who want to send their fucking kids back to school? What, mal- what, what militia are they in? What part of QAnon do they reside in? Mm-hmm. Fucking this God. He's so he's a sociopathic prick. It's fucking horrible. Ugh. I've interviewed him. Blah. So we're still a long way from this recall actually happening, but we can all keep our fingers crossed. Well, now let's onto, keep our fingers crossed. On to some blackout news. A man is facing 20 years in prison for urinating on his plane seat. Ah, oh, I peed all over my shirt today. Mm. Oh. At the urinal? No, at the sink. <laughs> no, <subway. laughs> hey, it's Broken my game. fucking sink. I'll do what I want with it. I was, I was doing a radio interview, and 
I was doing a I was doing a radio. You guys, before you judge, tell me what you would do. Okay. All right. Okay. <clears throat> I'm doing a radio interview this morning with uh, Armstrong and Getty, who are uh, plugging the Reno shows coming up. And I like to either do them in my car or I'll just go out and kind of walk outside around the block where I know I have good reception and no one's going to come up and ask me questions. And I got to point at my phone or whatever. So I was doing the interview out and about sort of out in the open on the sidewalk, but I realized I had to take a leak pretty, pretty badly. And, uh, I thought, Hmm, where do I take a leak? And I thought, well, it is my warehouse and it is my parking lot, but still there's some foot traffic here. So I'll slide inside the warehouse. And I really had to pee badly at this point. So I thought, how am I going to keep this interview going and then take a big time piss in a toilet? Mm -hmm. Because they're going to hear this. The acoustics are bad in the bathroom. So I decide I'll just (laughs) lean over the sink and I'll take a silent whiz into the sink Right. As I'm continuing my radio interview, which I dutifully did, but about halfway into the whiz, I noticed it didn't seem like anything was going into the sink. And I, oh, no. it's, I was wearing the gym shorts and the shirt had pulled out, gone over the penis. And all I was doing is peeing into my own shirt, which was directing it back into my own shorts. Oh, boy. Although it was stealthy. I got to say, in terms of silence. <laughs> it was quiet. muted. It was yeah. definitely <laughs> muted. Yes. It was, it was like peeing into a, a field of cotton. <laughs> it was silent in the pee department, but I was peeing all over myself. And then I couldn't really react to it. I was trying to adjust and continue with the interview. And uh, Can I ask, what what is your setup for the interview? Is it just... I had, ear ear bu- I had the earbuds. I had the earbuds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you had both hands free. I did. Well, I, I think I was holding the phone, and I. You're right. I should have. I should have set the phone down. No good place to set a phone down in a bathroom. The top of okay. the toilet's a little off right. camber. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. sink's not quite right. There's a lot of slipping and sliding going on there. But if I had, then you did the right move. Just to urinate on your shirt. <laughs> I was just peeing on my own shirt. Right. And then uh, that's all right. I'll be home in nine hours. Yeah. Change. <laughs> then you got the uh, the the choice where you have to kind of shake hands with the devil, which is, do I now douse my shorts and shirt with water, thus creating a huge wet spot in my shorts and shirt for the continuation of the day, or do I let the lesser amount of whiz dry write out? It, mm. Write it out. Yeah, I wrote it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Made the right decision. Well, the FBI arrested 24-year-old Landon Greer uh, after he wrote it out on March 9th. According to an affidavit, he was asked by a female flight attendant eight to ten times to put a face covering on, but he he refused and then, quote, began to push and swat her hand away as she tried to gently tap his shoulder to get his attention. He subsequently stuck her arm uh, two to three times uh, in an attempt to aggressively dismiss her, and then later in the flight... Two flight attendants recorded to, reported to a call button. The passenger reported to flight attendant A that passenger Greer was urinating in his seat. Mm. And saw him doing so, asked oh him to boy. sit down. The oh, flight attendant around, noticed that, his, that his, penis, his penis was out of his pants. Oh, no. oh I didn't think See, it was That's the that. mistake okay. oh. I made. I didn't full get my penis out of my pants. <laughs> Yeah, she Let told him learn. to put his penis back into his pants. His response was, "I have to pee." Mm. Several of the passengers right? around uh, yeah. were reseated, and then the flight was uh, brought to where it was going to go. the The gentleman said that beef, he he told investigators that he had had a uh, several beers and a couple of shots before bar- boarding the flight. He fell asleep on the plane and then awoke to being yelled at by the flight attendants who told him he was peeing. He said he had no recollection of hitting the flight attendant and didn't know he was peeing. Here's an interesting conundrum in the uh, unintended consequences file. Now that they've cut back on the booze or got rid of booze altogether on flights, a lot of guys are nervous flyers. Other guys just enjoy a pop on a flight. I I think maybe like tailgating where they don't serve alcohol in the stadium or something. Right, right. People tend to get their fill out in the parking lot. Like they'll make up for it where they can. 
Right. So I feel like a lot of guys that are used to ordering a couple of cocktails on a flight are now just cameling away the booze at the bar before they get on the flight, like trying to get the buzz to last them the four and a half hours or whatever it is. And there may be some overcompensating boozing. Maybe no booze on the plane gets you less overall buzzed people, but more blackout Spikes. drunk people. Yeah, yes. drunk people. Mm-hmm. But in so, a way, would you admit that even in blackout drunk, he was able to get his penis out of his pants and successfully urinate without hitting a shirt? I was stone cold sober. <laughs> it was 1030 in the morning and I still could not negotiate getting my dick out of my shorts and into the into the sink. Dr. Drew always cracks me up because he had a roommate in college who woke up blackout drunk, got up. Walked over, you got a picture of the old style record player with the flip lid on it. Mm -hmm. Walked up to it, flipped it up like it was the toilet seat, and then just started pissing all over the stereo. That's perfect, right? (laughs) Yes, perfect. One of my friends back in uh, Santa Barbara in our big party heydays, I woke up to him about to take a piss in the oven. Oh, really? Yeah, he lifted the seat, worked the other way, though. I was in Santa Barbara with some dudes and. one of them was drinking too much and got up and uh, urinated all over the bed that uh, a gal was sleeping in. Mm. Oh. So I found it oh, sort nice. of erotic in its own way. Well, in other penis news, a lawsuit filed in Harris County against NFL star Deshaun Watson alleges that the Houston Texans quarterback assaulted a massage therapist at her home by touching her with her his penis. The alleged incident occurred uh, last year at this time, March 30th, 2020. The lawsuit claims that Watson repeatedly told the massage therapist to focus on his, quote, groin area. And the woman began feeling incredibly uncomfortable after roughly 25 minutes. Due to Watson's comments and behavior, the massage therapist believed that he wanted a massage for only one reason, sex. Uh, Watson allegedly tried to direct the woman to his penis several times and purposely exposed the tip from Mm -hmm. under the towel he brought, uh, according to the lawsuit, which also says Watson would reposition himself so that he could purposely touch the plaintiff's hand with the tip of his erect penis. Well, if you've got a big honker and you're looking for groin work, and you're starting to become aroused, this is an inevitability, right? Yeah, I there's mean, nowhere you can go. How, how are we getting around this? It's going to be... Literally. It's gonna be, yeah, it's going to be difficult to navigate, right? Mm-hmm. I bet he would have hit the sink. I bet he <laughs> would have had a, a problem. Minefield. <laughs> oh, he just started pushing his penis into her hand? This is all, it's going to be hard to prove in a court of law because he's going to go, hey, I had a groin pull, so I wanted to focus on the groin, and, you know, I'm just as God made me, you know, I I can't help that. My dad was uh, well endowed, you know, and, uh, yeah, the blood was circulating, and the the Enya was pumping, and uh, we had, maybe I I shouldn't have lit the scented, scented candle. But, I, uh, called an, I called an audible, and that's, right. uh, that's what I did. That's right. yeah. Check down. Well, yeah. the woman who filed the suit uh, does did testify that directly after the incident, Deshaun Watson said to her, quote, I know you have a career and a reputation, and I know you would hate for someone to mess with yours, just like I don't want anyone messing with mine. This woman took that as a threat. and Possible thoughts. admission of guilt there. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yep. All right, but let's not judge. Let's move on to a piece of music news. Wolf Van Halen has called out the Grammys for their mm, paltry tribute to Eddie Van Halen. Oh, Uh, yeah. Personally, I did not see it, but it was about 15 seconds of the recorded rendition of the Eddie Van Halen guitar solo eruption. Mm. While a tastefully laid Eddie Van Halen guitar was on the stage. What was his beef? His beef was, and I'll read you the quote. The Grammys asked me to play Eruption for the In Memoriam section, and I declined. I don't think anyone could have lived up to what my father did for music but himself. It was my understanding that there would be an In Memoriam section where bits of songs were performed for legendary artists that had passed. I didn't realize they would only show Pop, his dad, for 15 seconds in the middle of four full performances of the others we had lost. What hurt the most 
was that he wasn't even mentioned when they talked about artists we lost in the beginning of the show. He was Ooh. sadly omitted from that. I know rock isn't the most popular genre right now, and the Academy does seem a bit out of touch, but I think it's impossible to ignore the legacy my father left on the instrument, the world of rock, and music in general. There will never be another innovator like him. I feel that way about my dad and his trumpet. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to put a flugelhorn out there. Then we're just going to back an air compressor up into the mouthpiece and let it fly. <laughs> um, all right. Why didn't they have his name in the in memoriam thing? It seems I weird. think it was the no name at the top of the show of Dawson. If I yes, it was that. at the top of the show where they mentioned um, Kenny who, Rogers. Who? Oh, I see. The other people. The big they question, did. I guess, is who is who were the people who he had beef with who got longer? First of all, were they full performances or were they like thirty seconds or a minute? Well, I unfortunately, I scrubbed the internet to try to find this. I can't find any piece of the Grammys on the internet that is the actual broadcast, so I can't mm -hmm. see anymore. And I did not watch it, but he alludes to four full performances, and this article here says that those performers were. Do, 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 do. Is I'll buy some time. Can that's sixteen to twenty minutes. Of little little yeah. Richard, Kenny Rogers, John Prine, and Jerry oh. Mardson. Hmm. I don't know who Jerry Mardson is, but uh, they could have done it. But I bet they weren't full performances. It's probably like a medley thing. But uh, can he play Eruption? Because uh, you better yes, you can. better nail Eruption. No. If you can't nail Eruption, it's going to sound like a shit show, right? Right. But I understand what he's saying. He didn't. Mm. He didn't want to. Uh, he doesn't think that that anyone could represent what his father could have done on stage. And it is true that Eddie Van Halen did more for budding guitar players in rock and roll, possibly than anyone else. I mean, even more than Hendrix, uh, Jimmy Page. Eddie Van Halen, especially through the dawn of MTV. Yeah, of his era, um, for sure. It, it, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of guitar players would say that their reason for playing the guitar was Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, he was kind of like what Top Gun was for naval flyer mm -hmm. recruitment. He was for guitar players. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, MTV probably opened up. Yeah, like Jimi Hendrix was so good and so crazy, he didn't inspire anyone. Everyone just watched him and went, oh, shit, I can't yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. We have an interesting twist on Germany or Florida. Mm. A woman By the way, said, I'm from Florida. I'm, I'm from Florida. Just oh, has an advantage. Oh, yeah, I'm well, having an advantage. I don't ring her. You'll be happy to know that a, a woman says she found true love and has had children with a roller coaster. <laughs> that roller coaster is either in Germany or Florida. Mm. I, I'm going to go Germany. This feels like Germany to me. Brian. Yeah, the weird outside the line sexual stuff. I always go German. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm going to go German as well. Although I hope to God it's Florida in the Tampa area. Well, yes. Gail Engel claims that she has oh. been long been <laughs> sexually attracted to inanimate objects, but she says she didn't know true passion until she fell for a German roller coaster. She says you could say that I'm sexually drawn to roller coasters. But since I met the Sky Scream roller coaster, I understood what love was. The a French woman says about her attraction to. Uh, She's not the, even German. Nope. Mm. But she fell in love with the German. She spends every moment dreaming of a carnal and fusional relationship with it. She's forty three years old. Said she has been sexually attracted to objects since she was age twelve. She's had three serious romantic human relationships but has found them all to be traumatic. So it's not like a toaster. Yeah. So yeah. what she does is um, she says dating a roller coaster does have its drawbacks. Um, <laughs> oh, really? The couple are unable to have any sexual physical relationship and meeting up is difficult. But she says, but life made me understand that sex was not a priority in my relationship, especially following the difficulties and trials we encountered in being able to not see each other. Yeah, meeting so. up should be easy. You always know mm -hmm. where it is. It's never going to mm -hmm. be anywhere else. Alone right. time might be a problem. I, I thought so too. You know, my maybe Wayne Fetterman could get this uh, show yeah. off the ground called "What Happened Here." 
which is, uh, you know, I go to the Home Depot, I interview the 81 year olds who are walking the plumbing aisle who are working there for $11 an hour. And I just go, what happened here? What went wrong? What happened? And then we interview like her parents, you know, 27 year old daughters banging a roller coaster. What happened here? This is what, uh, I got kids. I want to steer clear of this. What you guys do? What didn't you do? I'm all ears. Is it right? Is there some kind of tip you can give me where you think you went wrong? Yeah, just just <laughs> let me know so I don't go down is that path. Too much nurturing was it? Right. Did you, did you cuddle too much? Did you? Yeah, too much praise, not enough yeah, praise. Exactly. Is this a super high self esteem move? I could argue it was, <laughs> but I could also make an argument for super low self esteem as right. well. <laughs> All right, uh, let me hit uh, Liquid IV here. Oh, man, they make some good stuff. They do the energy multiplier. That's a game changer. Uh, it's a stick, and it's like drinking. It comes as a little stick. You just open it up, shake it up in the water. It's like drinking t- two cups of coffee, all-natural alternative to process energy drinks. Uh, whenever I travel, I bring the energy multiplier, and I also bring the hydration formula as well. Half of Americans struggle with fatigue and lack of motivation, poor mood, decreased focus. Uh, That's where liquid IV comes in. And like I said, especially if you're traveling, if you want to hydrate, you want to get the energy, just bring it with you, throw it in the backpack. Uh, Lemon lime, I love that, uh, love that flavor. Clean, uh, I should say clean ingredients, no GMOs, uh, vegan, gluten-free, no dairy, Soy free, extremely convenient packaging. It is Liquid IV, right, Dawson? Grab your energy Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, where you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code Adam at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you use promo code Adam at liquidiv.com. Start fueling your adventures today at liquidiv.com, promo code Adam. All right, let's do one more, Dawson. You're doing a yeoman's job, by the way. Thank you. Mm hmm. Well, we touched on this earlier, but over the weekend, marvelous Marvin Hagler passed away. His sudden death over the weekend, though, had nothing to do with the COVID-19 vaccine. That's what his wife is saying. Uh, Kay Hagler slapped down speculation that marvelous Marvin, 66, died after receiving the vaccine. She says, I do not accept that some stupid comment without knowing what really happened. She wrote in a post, for sure it wasn't the vaccine that caused his, caused his death. My baby left in peace with his usual, usually smile, usual smile must be. And now is the time, now is not the time to talk nonsense. Well, following the news of his death, here's what happened. His one-time rival turned pal, Thomas Hearns, fueled rumors of what caused the boxer's death. He's... Did you guys see this tweet on Instagram? No. He said, Are we quote, listening to a fucking the boxer? Hitman, the who hasn't, hasn't seen him in two decades? <laughs> well, he said it was his pal. I don't sure. know. It says a real true warrior. Pray for the king and his family. He's in ICU fighting the after effects of the vaccine. He'll be just fine, but we could use the positive energy, positive energy and pray for his full recovery. He wrote in a since deleted post. He followed that up. With this one saying, allow us to have our peace, our love and respect to Marvin and his family. This is not an anti-vaccine campaign. It's outrageous to have that in mind during the passing of a king, legend, father, husband, and so much more. That post was, post was also deleted. And it's interesting that he was saying, this is, it's outrageous to have this during the time of the passing of a king when he's the one who put it out there in the first place. But Hagler's own website said he died of natural causes near his home in New Hampshire, but does not elaborate. It's weird. That's Thomas the Hitman Fauci. (laughs) World's greatest boxing (laughs) epidemiologist. Um, He... So Hitman Hearns, before he's dead, saying he's in the hospital, he had a reaction to the vaccine... Which is like, I don't know where he got this information, but it, maybe they know each other. They, they've they stayed in touch or they're friends or whatever it is. I don't know why he's saying that, but it's peculiar. And then he dies very shortly thereafter. And then Hearns walks it back, I guess. Um, now, it seems crazy, but it's also weird, right? I mean, where did he why did he think he was reacting to the vaccine before he died? Right. And what got him into the ICU? And then 
we're not really hearing anything from the family about why he died. Right. He so, must have had some kind of information or misinformation to make that claim in the first yeah. place. Occam's razor would say he maybe got the vaccine given his age and then he coincidentally got sick given his age and died. I mean, that's totally Yeah, that totally reasonable. could happen. But then where does Hearns work in it? Does Hearns is just like doing a math where he's like, he got the he vaccine, might. then he went to the hospital, so he must have had a reaction to the vaccine. That's possible. That was my, that was my thought. Yeah. Like, he, like he, the, the timeline of events is he got his shot, he got sick, and he got in the hospital. Maybe he just put, you know, two and two and two together. Yeah. Interesting. Or just two or and two. Or maybe he got sick <laughs> from the vaccine. Who knows? I, I don't know. I mean, there's there's probably a very small percentage of people that would. Just yeah. very. I mean, yeah, everyone's freaked out. But take the fucking vaccine. But yeah, maybe you know one point you know percent of one one hundredth may die of it. That could happen. It still doesn't mean he shouldn't get it. But uh, it's curious. What uh, what Hearns? What the hell Hearns now? Mm. All right, let's bring it home, Dawson. Mike Dawson, news is over. Sweet man. All right, last but not least, there is uh, Geico. Geico, do you own? Do you rent? Well, you do one or the other. How about you get your bundle going with Geico at Geico.com? Take your homeowners, your renters, and your automotive policy. Bundle up, bundle down. Good thing, too, because you're so busy already. Go to Geico.com, get a quote, see just how much you could save. It is so easy when you go to Geico.com and get your bundle on. Yeah, me and Reno uh, tomorrow, I guess, as you hear this, uh, mm-hmm. doing the brew house over there, doing stand-up, Virginia the Street Brew House. full capacity? It's a full capacity? Yeah. It's something, some version of something. <laughs> okay. Jam in the van, speak easy. We told you about that's coming up on the 25th, doing two shows there. Nashville Zanies, I'm sure that'll be, that. we're doing a live pod there. That's April 14th. That'll be full. And then uh, just go to amcurl.com for all the live shows. Wayne Fetterman, everyone, the history of stand-up. Go there and uh, learn something. Read that book. From Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle, it's available now on Amazon. And uh, shoot him a tweet at Fetterman, just like it sounds. So, until next and great job, Dawson. Until next time, I'm Carl for Mike Dawson and Wayne Fetterman. And Bob Ryan saying, mahalo. Mahalo.